We're going to call the Joint Revenue Committee meeting to order. Uh, we'll start uh, with the roll call and we'll have some announcements right after that. Senator Case? Present. Senator Ellis? Excuse. Senator Kinski? Excuse. Senator Wasserberger? Excuse. Representative Connolly? Here. Representative Dayton? Here. Representative Furphy? Here. Representative Hallinan? Uh, excused. Sorry. Representative Kinner. Uh, excused. Representative Larson. Excused. Representative Obermuller. Representative Paxton. Excused. Co-Chairman Madden. Here. Co-Chairman Peterson. Here. Okay. Seven present. All right. We have seven present, uh, which is a quorum in our uh, rules. And uh, we're gonna, we're gonna. Uh, first of all, I have some announcements, uh, and this is for the committee as much, and also for the people who are going to testify. That you need to have the microphone on, which is a red light up here. I assume there are red lights there too. Uh, so if you don't have the microphone on, the world can't hear you. And uh, if uh, you're done, when you're done, you need to shut the microphone off because if you start talking about extraneous things, uh, then you've got, um, uh, you've got people all over the world hearing that. So uh, let the record show that Senator Kinski is now here. And um, the, Senate is ready. The, Senate, the Senate is ready. And um, what else are we gonna talk about? Uh, oh, um, the reason we don't have as many here as possible is I'm, it might be my fault, but I'm not prepared to totally admit that yet. But <laughs> when I looked at the schedule, yeah, at, at our schedule, I could see there was no way we could fit in everything we had to do in this meeting in two days, even if we started at 8 o'clock. And my policy and, and Senator Peterson's policy has always been we, that we don't work into the dinner hour because people don't do good work then. So that's why we're meeting a half a day earlier than what we had uh, scheduled. But anyway, when I looked at this at the uh, legislative calendar, there was no meeting. I didn't see it anyway. Uh, there was a meeting on Monday and Tuesday, but it was going to be out Tuesday. And then Wednesday was dead. And I thought, well, we could make it by if we put it at one o'clock on Wednesday it would be OK. Well, it turned out uh, for whatever reason, education is meeting today. And uh, so we have some members, uh, particularly the House members, but we also have Senator Wasserberger is on education. So that's the reason he's not here. Luckily, we have some bills that aren't so controversial today, and uh, hopefully we'll get them out and to the, to the, uh, uh, to the general session uh, uh, at the close of business today. Um, 
I guess that's all I have. If anybody else has anything you want to add before we start, otherwise we will start. Go ahead. Did Mr. we talk Coach about here. holding votes until the other committee members could be here on these bills today? Could we postpone those votes until tomorrow? We could. Uh, we could do that. Uh, if how would that work? If, if if there's some people that have a problem with the bill and they're going to vote no on it, uh, if you'd have the courtesy to tell me that so we could hold the vote until tomorrow. Uh, we've got eight people here. We need seven to get it passed. And if there's going to be more than one person that's going to be opposed to a bill, then we're going to have to hold the vote. But please <laughs> tell me if you're going to uh, be opposed to it. So but that's thanks a lot. Yes. I think the majority of the present huh? uh, mr chairman you yeah I, I, you would need a majority of a quorum so you would you would need uh five oh votes okay. To pass. okay well i think we're probably okay then mr chairman yes yeah, so senator kinski the other option is is we could go ahead and take a vote and you could just hold it open and, and those yeah. folks can come in tomorrow and just yeah. do it that's right. that's a good suggestion whatever you want I, to do i think that's that's well taken we'll we'll still have a vote here but we'll hold it open for for the, the number that's, okay, good. That's a good deal. Okay, the first item on the agenda is uh, uh, water, Wyoming lottery amendments. The, you, those of you on the committee will remember we had this on the uh, uh, on the September meeting, and there were some things that uh, uh, a couple of committee members thought needed to be looked at and put into the bill. So uh, it was it was added to and it was worked on and the, the goal here is to, to um, you know, make a, a better sense out of the draft or out of the lottery bill and yet not harm the, the operation itself because they're doing very well. Although I haven't won any grand prize yet, I think they're doing well over there. Um, I'm going to turn it over to Representative Obermuller and, and kind of give us a Reader's Digest update on what happened since the last meeting, and then I think, uh, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the um, yeah, Just overall, uh, from the beginning, uh, a, a lot of work has been put in this by LSO and by uh, the lottery to come up with a, a little better statute. I think the, the purpose of this project was to conform the statute to the financial model uh, required by generally accepted accounting principles. And what it does, it allows the lottery to retain a portion of its earnings for its own growth and needs while freeing up the use of unclaimed prizes, which in a current statute is highly restricted. Uh, the goal is to form the lottery around a solid business model and to enhance its chances for financial success and thereby increasing revenues to the lottery and to the state, which is our ultimate goal here. And uh, so I have asked uh, Matt Kaufman, the, the attorney who has helped with the draft and work and is uh, contracted with the lottery to, uh, to present the bill, if you would, please. Okay, that's a good idea. Mr. Uh, Mr. Kaufman, could you uh, uh, introduce yourself and then uh, we'll uh, listen to you a while. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, Representative Obermuller. Um, as was stated, my name is Matt Kaufman. I'm an attorney with Hathaway and Coons here in Cheyenne. We're outside legal counsel uh, for the Wyoming Lottery Corporation. I would note with me present is uh, board member Mary Throne, uh, CEO John Klontz, COO Robin, and Robin just got married and I always forget her, Mendina, last name, and the CFO Lloyd Jackson. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll, I'll breeze through this uh, relatively quickly and then uh, I, I discussed this pre previously with Representative Obermuller but the lottery would request or it does have a request for three very minor uh, amendments to the bill just to clean up a few things uh, but I'll save that for the end. Um, moving on to on the page two of the bill uh, Mr. Chairman uh, the first is in the the definition section um, this this is simply again a, uh, a clarification in statute uh, right now there's a definition of the statute that, that defines major procurement contracts that the lottery might enter into. Um, the, the statute currently just arbitrarily defines a major procurement contract as that being for $75,000. It doesn't uh, specify a time period. So we're simply uh, bringing into that a time period. 
Um, so right now it says in a calendar year. Uh, this, the next line, uh, we also strike out the word major uh, just because we feel it's a little ambiguous to distinguish between major advertising contracts and any other advertising contract. Um, moving on to the, to, uh, the bottom of page two, uh, this, this section deals with changing the definition of the word net proceeds. And just to, to back up to our conversation that we had at the, at the last committee hearing, to refresh all of your memory, generally speaking, how the, the, the lottery distribution works is the lottery makes revenue. It has a certain amount that it has to set aside for prize payments uh, for, for people that win the jackpot. Uh, and then there are expenses. And the, the remainder is what we define as net proceeds. And the net proceeds is what gets uh, conveyed to the state. Uh, this this new revised definition um, simply cleans up what exactly net proceeds uh, is and how it's defined. So now it will simply read net proceeds is all revenue to the lottery, less direct, indirect, operating and non-operating expenses consistent with gap accounting principles. We sort of remove from the definition a bunch of words that don't appear in the statute and words that aren't consistent with gap accounting principles. Uh, moving on to the next page, page three in 917-108, uh, A, subsection I. This is just simply simply a technical change. There exists in the, in the language of the statute now uh, the word instant lotteries, which is very confusing because in the lottery world there is no instant lottery game. So that's, that's uh, uh, sort of an incorrect term of art. We're just simply replacing that with the word uh, words instant win tickets, which again is a lottery recognized terminology. It's not changing what games the lottery is authorized to offer or participate in, it's just correcting the, the statutory language. Uh, moving down to 917 uh, 110. Uh, again, you might recall from our discussion at the last committee hearing, we have a little bit of a conundrum uh, with the lottery right now. Even though the lottery is a state owned private corporation, uh, the lottery went out and created a 401k for its employees. Uh, a few years ago, we got a very nice letter from the IRS explaining that um, we didn't qualify to have a 401k. And so uh, the lottery then went to the state retirement system, which the state retirement system currently um, hosts uh, not, the, not the deferred compensation, but the pension port of the lottery employees' um, retirement compensation and asked them to host the 401k. Uh, the retirement system has also very politely said we can't do it because you don't have authorizing language in your statute. So we're in this weird spot right now where we don't have a legal place to host the 401k. Uh, we're just asking for this language, which is uh, the same language that almost any other agency has uh, authorizing the retirement system to host its deferred compensation plan. Um, moving on to 917.111. Again, this is dealing then with the overall disposition of the lottery proceeds. And again, we're, we're just changing and cleaning up the terminology of the language as now we're going to focus on the total revenue of the lottery, back out the expenses, and then pay you know the, the proper percentage to the state. So we're getting rid of that word net proceeds and changing uh, with, with net revenue or total revenue. Moving to subsection B of 917.111, um, this quite honestly, is probably the most substantive change, I, I might say, uh, to this entire bill. And this, this changes or cleans up, I should say, what, what we presented and what we discussed uh, up in Buffalo at the last committee hearing. The, the mechanism is now much simpler to read. Instead of trying to define a ratio or to come up with some mathematical um, justification for how the lottery computes what amount is, is owed, we come up with just a straight percentage. So as we talked about, we now have the, to uh, the total lottery revenue. We subtract out the, the, the prizes and all other expenses, and you get to this net proceed number. And now we're just simply saying the lottery has to transfer a minimum of 75% of that net proceed number to the state. And then we create a mechanism where there can be reconciliation um, at the end of every fiscal year. The only uh, reason I would point out that that reconciliation piece is important is because as with any retail or sales business at the end of a quarter, you always have that overlap until, you know, you can, you can true up what the sales actually were and, and balance the books. You know what that transfer should have been at that point in time. And this allows us a mechanism to reconcile that at year end. Can I ask a question here or should we wait? 
uh, if that's appropriate, you go ahead and ask it. Otherwise, you can wait. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Kaufman, so just so I get the figures correct in my head, if we've got the total, I don't want to use any of the language that you, you've used in here and defined it, but we've got the total amount of money that comes into the lottery. 45% goes out for prizes, leaving 55%. Then subsection B has us take 75% of the 55%. So that leaves about what 10 to 15 percent of the kind of total that the lottery has taken in. What happens to that 10 to 15 percent? So, Mr. Chairman and Representative Connolly, I might have to bring some some financial folks up to an answer that question. But generally speaking, that 10 or 15 percent is going to comprise the operating expenses, administrative expenses, and the the ongoing operation of the lottery. Uh, Representative Obermiller. Uh, yes, uh, Representative Connolly. Uh, the the de the change of the definition of net proceeds uh, brings that number down, and it's all inclusive. All expenses are coming off of revenue. The forty five, all administrative, all non operating, everything comes off of there before the seventy five percent is applied. It's applied at the very end. It's net income before a 75% distribution. Does, does that help? Okay, go ahead, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If there's no other questions on that section, I think we're done with that section. Um, then moving on to the, to the bottom of, of page five. Um, this, this change, Mr. Chairman, has to do with, currently in the statute, the lottery is required, if, if you recall a few minutes, to go, I talk about the definition of a major procurement contract, and the lottery is required for any major procurement contract to put it out for a competitive bid, which is totally fine. The lottery is not asking to change that. What we've run into, though, is there have been a number of instances where the lottery has negotiated an ongoing contract down, or you know, signed an extension or an amendment to it. And what we would like to avoid is having to go through the incredible expense of an RFP process just every time we do an amendment or an extension or something like that of an existing contract. So what this uh, subsection does is it attempts to uh, create times where the lottery doesn't have to put it out for, for an RFP. The first is if there's only one qualified vendor. And then the second would be, um, as the language reads now, uh, if the major procurement contract is an amendment extension uh, or renewal of an existing contract and then has some other verbiage which we'll talk about in a moment. So that's that's all that change gets at. Um, the next section, 917.116, um, I can summarize this one very quickly. Every time the lottery signs up a new retail location, uh, it's required to take a, a small fee from those retailers and put it into what the statute defines as a fidelity fund. The theory of that fund being that if a retailer went out of business or went bankrupt and there were prizes that needed to be paid from that retailer, that there's a fund with which we can draw from. The statute sets that, um, that fund to be able to go up to a half a million dollars. We're now, what, four, five years into the lottery operation and we don't think we're ever gonna need anywhere near a half a million dollars. So we're simply reducing that down to $250,000. So the idea there being when it, that fidelity fund hits 250000 everything else spills over into the amount that would be transferred to the state. Um, moving on to 917.119. Um, this gets at what Representative Obermuller was speaking of before. There's a, uh, an amount of money that the lottery has in its possession at any given time. The, the amount changes when people win prizes, but they don't claim them. The lottery obviously has to accrue that or, or, or account for that in some way. And those funds become known as the unclaimed prize account. Currently in our statute, those unclaimed prize account funds are incredibly restricted. The lottery can't do much with that money. Um, this change would, would remove those restrictions and allow the lottery to use that money in other ways. Um, and as I promised you all at the last meeting in Buffalo, there was an incidental change that, that was my fault where we struck out the language regarding the funding of problem gambling and that was unintentional. That's been fixed. So that all stays the, the, the same as it has been uh, from the beginning. Um, and then let's see, moving on to page eight, section nine, 
17128. Uh, this is just cleanup language. We're, we're removing the words operating expenses and administrative, uh, again, to be consistent with this new net proceed definition and, and what's defined as net proceeds. Um, Mr. Chairman, I think that's, that's everything. If I could circle back now to just the three minor changes um, that, that I might make to, to help clean up the bill. The first would be on page one, and this is going to seem very nitpicky. I don't mean it to, Mr. Chairman. Um, there's, some, there's some language in the summarization of the bill on the third line indicating clarifying the types of games that may be conducted. And I recognize this isn't statute, but your colleagues and you all rely heavily on this language in, in session to, to get up to speed quickly as to what a bill might be. Um, this, this statutory change, while it does change the word uh, instant lotteries to instant win tickets, it's not in any way, shape, or form changing the games. We're just fixing an incorrect term to a correct term. Right. So I was wondering if maybe striking that language in the uh, in the summary might be helpful to your colleagues because I, I just don't want to mislead people. Well, is there some way you could, uh, I don't know what the right term would be, like um, bringing, bringing up to or modifying archaic language or, you know, yeah. or what is the right word? Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. So uh, the Constitution says we got to say what a bill has in it. So we have to have a sentence there relating to that section that's changed, but it doesn't have to be those words. So if we could come up with. Um, and I'm happy, Mr. Mr. Chairman, Chairman, to work with uh, with the LSO to, to make a suggestion. If, if uh, that would Mr. Be. Chairman, it could probably be something like uh, revising terminology or, or something to that effect. OK. Somebody write that down. We'll use that. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, Senator Kinski. While I might be confused by clarifying in some other term, I have enough confidence in the balance of my colleagues that they're not going to be unduly confused by the word clarifying. I don't I don't see it as being something that we really spent a whole lot of time on. Well, well I think it's so minor to me. It just when it says clarifying the types of games or something, it it, it sends up a flag, I think, that we're we're going to expand it, or isn't that kind of what the, the problem is? As you see it, that that's ex that was exactly yeah. my concern, Mr. Chairman. But I totally defer to the committee. Whatever you whatever you think is fine. We'll talk. the The next amendment I would ask for, Mr. Chairman, is on page two, uh, nine seventeen one zero three. In that definition of the major procurement contract, we currently have the new language that says in a calendar year. We would just like to strike the word calendar and replace it with fiscal year. The lottery works on a fiscal year that's not a calendar year, just like the state does. Um, and then on page six, Mr. Chairman, going back to that uh, language we were talking about where it's those instances where the lottery is exempted out of putting something out for a competitive bid. And so this language on page six currently reads, so, so this again would be an instance where the lottery doesn't have to put it out for competitive bid. The, the major procurement contract is an amendment, extension, or renewal of existing contract. And, and we would recommend just putting a period right there and striking the balance of that, that language. The reason being that we just had some concern if with the rest of that line saying with terms that are not materially different, well, there have been many instances where, for okay. example, our advertising contract, we've negotiated it substantially down. It's probably materially different, but it's to the favor of the lottery. You're right. We just don't want to set ourselves up for a problem there. So we thought putting a period there and striking the balance that line might leave it a little cleaner. Okay, thank you very much. Those were all of the suggested amendments we had, Mr. Chairman. Do you have anything else to add? No, I don't think so. I appreciate all of your attention. I any appreciate questions? Mr. Obermuller's work on this as well. Is there any other? Uh, thank you very much, but don't leave yet. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can leave the desk, but the, is there anyone else from the department or any department agency that wants to speak on this is there anybody uh any public comment <laughs> we do have public comment introduce yourself and who you represent good afternoon mr chairman i'm a member of the committee pete obermuller executive director of the wyoming county commissioners association appreciate <laughs> the opportunity uh and appreciate all the hard work on this bill uh we support the bill mr chairman i just wanted to uh, offer um a couple of comments, a reminder about a little bit of a, a history here of where all this started. It wasn't 
uh, it wasn't really born out of um, uh, just some sort of level of nerdery about uh, fixing statue. Really, what what part of the problem was, and to get to Representative Connolly's questions, it was uh, the way that the statue was set up. Uh, and I'm not casting aspersions on it. I think it was it was set up. Uh, um, in the best way it could in order to get the lottery created, quite frankly. But but the way that it's set up, it really provides the lottery no mechanism uh, to set up a reserve fund of any kind to deal, deal with uh, um, uh, unexpected expenses. Well, over time, that, uh, quite frankly, just irritated me and uh, irritated my members, and we started to, to push the lottery about what they were transferring to the state. And uh, over time, I was persuaded that the best way to, uh, to perhaps uh, tackle that was to uh, go into their authorizing statute and, and make these sort of these uh, these changes to allow them that. So to represent Connolly's question, they, you know, they have the total revenue, and of that, uh, as near as practical, 45% of that uh, should be for prizes. And then they redefine net proceeds to be all of the various expenses, direct, indirect, like Representative Overmuller talked about, uh, that defines net proceeds. And then uh, the part that's transferred is at least 75% of what is whatever is left, that could be very small. I think I think probably in, in a perfect world we'd prefer that seventy five percent to be higher than that because really what we're talking about is what do they do with the with the other twenty five percent? That's that's an amount of money after they've paid all of their expenses and after they've transferred to the state and they still have this pot of money there. It's at least seventy five, uh, but they could theoretically save that. The purpose for that, Mr. Chairman, I think, is so that they can build this reserve. Uh, which is which I think is important right now because right now the way it works uh, based on the statute is they, they do all the expenses all these restricted funds and then whatever comes out the bottom is what comes to the state and the only place they have to deal with on un, un, unexpected expenses is from that that down there they have to turn the spigot down for the transfers in order to manage that this allows them to have a reserve so we have recognized that, that in the in the near term that might result in less transfers but in the long term, we think it'll be beneficial, it'll result in a more healthy lottery, which will result in healthier transfers. Uh, so that's why I think, Mr. Chairman, it, it does require uh, oversight over the, you know, in, in the coming years. Uh, but I can assure you that that um, our friends over at the cities and and we will continue to uh, to watch that. Okay, thank you. Any questions for Mr. Obermiller? Hey, thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> thank you. Anyone else want to speak from the public? Okay. Uh, committee, what's your wishes on this? Yes. Representative Furphy, go ahead. Who's question two? To Mr. Kaufman. I just need educated on this. Um, I just, everyone else probably understands it, but I don't. On this 401k situation, you read this section and it says the employees will be covered by the Wyoming Retirement Act, the state employees, uh, deferred compensation, et cetera. So the 401k, is that it? Or do they also qualify for state pensions under this? Mr. Mr. Chairman and Representative Furphy, uh, so my understanding is currently the lottery employees, uh, I think there's eight currently employees, do qualify for the state pension. Right. They do not qualify for the 457 deferred compensation plan, which is essentially like a 401k. And that's what the lottery went out to, to set up privately mm -hmm. before the IRS came back and said, no, you have to do that through right. your state. And so in, in talking with the uh, Wyoming Retirement System, they felt like this was the language that was needed to fully authorize them to handle it. Yep. Uh, did you have another question? Sure. Go ahead. So are we contributing both to a 401k and the state retirement no, plan? I mean, Mr. Chairman, my understanding, Representative Furphy, is that, I mean, the lottery currently is contributing to the 401k on behalf of its employees, and I think that will con continue, is my understanding, um, a as it is. It will just be hosted by the, the state of Wyoming. Yeah. Okay. 
the only thing I could add, because I used to be on the retirement board, uh, is that the, the, a common use of the 401k in Wyoming is that it, it adds an improvement factor to when you retire. The Wyoming standard Wyoming retirement system is not built to provide cost of living adjustments. Okay. So the best uh, option for people and what they're doing by the dozens, I understand, is to buy a 401k and tailor it to the, the cost of living ex, ex adjustments that they expect they will need when they retire. So it's, they kind of go hand in hand. I think that's my only reason of bringing that up. It, you really have to have them both if you're going to be doing sound planning for your old age, like my age. Uh, Mr. Chairman. Yes, Representative Obermiller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think uh, Representative Furphy is kind of wondering if they're currently involved with the uh, defined benefit plan as it currently exists, and I think that answer is yes, isn't it? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I'm hearing from the lottery folks that that is correct. And so this adds the piece of the 401k. Right. Correct. Mm -hmm. Anyone else have a question? Yes, Senator Kinski. And I, I think this question is unique. I, I believe. Yes, it's not. I believe this is for Mr. Kaufman, if not perhaps somebody else from the Lottery Commission. I'm concerned. As you'll recall, there was a statewide paper that wanted information from the Lottery Corporation. And the Lottery Corporation steadfastly maintained, we're just a private company. We're not a state agency. You have a right to nothing. They finally begrudgingly released something. Now here we see a bill that the lottery, a private state corporation, enjoys the benefit of the Wyoming retirement system. would like to add to that the State Employees and Officials Group Insurance Act, the Wyoming Deferred Compensation Act, and host the 401k. And then back on page six to continue the uh, transparent, or page seven or eight, we're gonna strike from required disclosure on pages, on lines eight and nine, operating expenses and administrative expenses. I guess I, I don't get it. It's like having your cake and eat it too. You're either a state agency that's a corporation of the state and you get the state employee benefits and you comply with the Open Records and the Public Meetings Act, or you're not a state agency and you don't have to comply with those acts, in which case, why is it that I must extend all the benefits of being a state employee to this private corporation? Because I have a private corporation of my own. I, there's a lot of people with private corporations that like to get onto the state retirement system and to the state and health insurance. So help me to understand why this is not completely contradictory in, in talking out about both sides of our mouth. Because I think it looks bad to the public when we're not transparent, but we dispense benefits this way. Sure. Um, Mr. Chairman, the CEO of the lottery, Mr. John Klontz, joined me. I'm going to, if I may respond to that question real quickly, and I'll let Mr. Mr. Klontz jump in. Senator Kinski, I, um, that's been a question, quite frankly, that we have wrangled with at the lottery from, from the outset in terms of defining what, what is the lottery corporation and, and how does it operate. What I can tell you, and this, this was vernacular that I created because after wrestling with the statute for a number of years, I, I believe that there are numerous examples of entities like this, not necessarily in Wyoming, but in other states, where the lottery truly is a private corporation that is owned and for the benefit of the state of Wyoming. Now, in, in setting up and establishing that corporation, as you well know, the lottery was given no initial appropriation whatsoever. So it had to go privately contract with vendors, with banks, with service providers to be able to, to, to provide the services that a lottery provides. What, what I've come to believe is the importance or the benefit of having the lottery operate as a private corporation gives it the ability to maneuver, gives it the ability to contract, gives it the ability to keep certain of that contractual information private so that it can compete as well as it can. If the lottery was set up as a state agency, which there are many examples of that throughout the, the United States, as you well know, there tend to be inefficiencies. There, there tends to be slowness with respect to the maneuverability of, of both the games, of the vendor relationships, of the contracting relationships. And quite frankly, uh, amongst a lot of the, the lottery attorneys that I've, I've come to be colleagues with, uh, there, there's definitely, a, a, I think, a preference towards operating a lottery like a corporation just because of the, of the benefits that I just explained. With respect to the 
um, the, the the public uh, records act and and the, the meetings act and things like that. Again, I think I've come to believe that there's actually great wisdom in the way that the statute was originally drafted, and that is, it says, the lottery you have to comply with open uh, open records act, with the exception of those things that you deem to be confidential and proprietary. In other words, those things that might give someone your competitive advantage, and that's what the lottery has has had to strike the balance between. And I think pontificating here for just a minute, if I might, Mr. Chairman, in the early days of the lottery, that was a really tough pill for some people to swallow because they were used to treating entities like a state agency saying, give me all your records. We have to give you all the records. And when the lottery was first establishing itself, it had to figure out where to draw that line. And that was not an easy thing to do, but on things like, you know, what rate am I paying to this contractor where someone else might come, you know, come bid it. Some of that competitive information the lottery felt compelled to protect itself and not disclose that information, and it got beat up a little bit for that, but I think we've gotten past that. But but the, the, the act very clearly states that then when it comes to open meetings, the lottery is permitted to operate much like a board of directors, any board of directors of a private corporation. Well, that's where I think the lottery, to their credit, have taken it way above and beyond what they're required to do at law and say, we're going to have our meetings open, unless it's an executive session or something where they're going to consult with their attorney for legal legal advice, we're going to have the meetings open and invite the public. So there's been this, this sort of constant balancing between, we're not a state agency, we are a private corporation, we need to operate as competitively as we can for the benefit of the state, because all of the net proceeds or profit go to the state, but at the same time, you know, keep and maintain as much transparency as possible. And so I think you know, again, in some respects, this was the hand the lottery was dealt with respect to initially employees being able to participate in the uh, in the pension plan. Right. Uh, the, the act was just silent with respect to the 401k plan. It's not necessarily creating a new expenditure for the state. The lottery has all along the way been contributing on behalf of its employees and funding that 401k plan. It's just housed in a spot right now that's technically not compliant with IRS regs. So we need to house it somewhere else. So with, with, with all respect, Mr. Chairman, I don't think that that fundamentally changes the game or is contradictory any more than it already has been. And and again, we we maintain this vernacular that we're a quasi you know agency, we're a, we're a we're a private corporation for the benefit of the state, and it is it is a gray area on a lot of those things, and we're we're continually trying to strike that balance. The the last comment I wanted to make, Mr. Chairman, is just with respect to that comment on on page eight regarding. The information that doesn't have to be submitted. The only reason that language is being struck is because we're, we're changing those terms, not because we don't want to give you that information. That information will still exist. It's just going to be not called an operating expense and administrative expense in the way that the statute is drafted. So we're not we're not removing any reporting obligations of ourselves. All expenses. Okay, thank you. Do you have anything to add, uh, Mr. Klons? Yes, Mr. Chairman, just really quickly. And uh, Senator Kensky, I just wanted to make sure that we're clear on the lottery, myself, we were perfectly content with the 401k plan that the board approved. We were going along with this thing and through an IRS random audit, we were told we couldn't have it and that we weren't permitted to do it and therefore uh, went back to when the state retirement system said because of the language we weren't permitted to have the accompanying 457. So it wasn't that we were asking to uh, get rid of the 401k and get into the 457 we were told we can no longer continue this. So we went, uh, Matt and his team went back to the state retirement system and basically said, what do we do? And then the suggestion was that what we needed to do was get into the 457. And then that evolved into this re need for this language change. But it wasn't that we it came out and said we were asking to get into the 457. Yep. The government did. Mr. Chairman. Yes, yep. Senator Kinski. I thought the ask, and this is what I understand, why doesn't subparagraph H on three simply say the Wyoming State Retirement System is authorized to host the 401k plan for the Wyoming Lottery Private Corporation? Good question. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, it, it certainly could. That was the language that we pulled from other statutory examples of what the uh, retirement folks prefer to be their authorizing language so that we were just doing it for consistency purposes. Okay, thank you. We could consider that as in an amendment later if we want. Anyone else have anything to talk about on this? We're kind of running out of our allotted time. Go ahead. Chairman, just a, a, a representative, go ahead. Thank you. Um, 
just as an analogy for Senator Kinski, no analogy is perfect, but something like this came up in terms of the UW Foundation employees and whether or not they were UW employees for purposes of health insurance and retirement. And the answer was kind of officially no because they are a separate corporation, but they too then became under the UW health insurance and um, pension. I'm 99% sure. So it's not exact, but it's somewhat, but I do have a question. And Mr. Kaufman, so I do now understand better about that. This really does set up a reserve account for the lottery. And I'm curious if there's any cap on that reserve. Could you answer that? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Conley, and I would defer to Representative Obermuller if, if I misstate this at all, but there's no cap currently on the reserve, just the requirement, again, uh, that the lottery continue, and there will be a reconciliation period for every fiscal year, but continue to transfer no less than the 75% of the net proceeds. So in, in effect, I guess it would put a cap on the savings every year of 25% of the net proceeds, but but not a hard dollar figure cap. In it, but that's just the maximum, right? I mean, you could you could you could revert more of that if you felt you could afford it, right? I mean, yeah. So, that, Mr. Chairman, that's correct. And for for what it's worth, if we were using the seventy five percent number today, the lottery already transfers more than that. Yeah. Again, as as Mr. Oprah Mueller uh, presented a few moments ago, the idea here is that currently the lottery is set up that. Every cent that comes in, there's expenses, and then all of it goes to the state. There's no ability for the lottery to absorb ebbs and flows and jackpots and contingencies. This just hopefully creates an evening out of the lottery's financials. Okay. Any Mr. Chairman, on that? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Representative Obermiller. Yeah, thank you. Uh, also in response uh, to your question about uh, setting a cap on it, initially, uh, this this is an effort to uh, bring the lottery out of a hole that it has in its operating fund. So we're trying to heal it up to begin with. I, but your question is valid, and over time, as you as you measure this year to year, you may very want to say very much might want to say at some point, we think that your equity section is strong enough to carry you into the future, and we're going to close this off. But for now, I think we need to leave the flexibility to just just watch it and monitor it and and uh, and see where it goes. Okay, thank you. Anyone else, Mr. Chairman? Uh, Senator Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mr. Chairman, um, I'd like to ask Mr. Kaufman a little bit more about the open meeting statute and the public records statute. I'm trying to figure out how that tracks in, following up a little bit on um, Senator Kinsky's line of questioning. And so. Um, not in the bill, but in the Lottery Act, I see where in 917.120, it references that the, the corporation is subject to the provisions of WS 164201 through 164205, which I understand to be the Public Records Act. Uh, at the end of that paragraph, it, um, well, and that paragraph talks about information that can be confidential. That's not uncommon in our in our environmental quality statute, for example. The uh, uh, Department of Environmental Quality can maintain trade secrets and stuff as being confidential and keep it out of the act um, or keep from releasing it. Then it goes on and it says, information deemed confidential pursuant to that long list that's in here is exempt from the provisions of the Public Records Act and uh, that would be 164201 through 164205 then it says meetings or portions of meetings devoted to the discussing information deemed confidential to this subsection are exempt and i th i think the statute reference might be wrong here i think that should be the open meetings act but i think in the law that's back to the public records act that's doing 4201 through 4205 instead of the meeting section which is 4401 through 4408. And I'm, I'm, I'm just wondering about that. And I'm wondering if we might want to consider bringing that into the bill. There is another place. Let me see. There's another place in the bill that references uh, public records. Um, but I think if, we, if you tailored it like the uh, Department of Environmental Quality's restrictions are tailored, it might be the best of all worlds for you. Instead of and you've been in this awkward place where people made requests and we no one's agreed. 
Um, maybe we could fix it better. Uh, I'd hate to let this bill go by because once it's in the session, we can't bring that other title in here. But if we brought in the, the parts that reference open meetings, um, which is 917.120A and 917.124B, then we could deal with that uh, as we learn more about how it should be dealt with. Do you have any remarks? Uh, Mr. Mr. Chair, my only response to that would be, uh, Senator, you're, you're correct. There is no reference, as far as I know, in the lottery statute to uh, the open meetings portion. Mm -hmm. uh, you are correct. I think the only references are to the open records. But, is, Mr. Chairman, I guess following is that problematic? Because um, does that mean that your meetings are not subject or are subject? I guess they would be are subject. Uh, uh, Mr. Chairman, um, not to not to again get too legal and technical, but but using a, a legal analysis on this, uh, my argument would be, or my position has been, if the statute specifically obligates the lottery to the Public Records Act, but is silent with respect to the Public Meetings Act, I think it's hard to make the case that the Public Meetings Act automatically applies. That being said, I, I'd like to remind the committee that the lottery has made it a practice from day one of holding board meetings and all of its meetings in a public forum, public setting, with the exception of those parts that pertain to that confidential information. And Mr. Chairman and Mr. Kaufman, um, exactly. So wouldn't it be better to bring the Open Meetings Act and then allow you to have those same exceptions that other things are? And then we wouldn't be arguing about this anymore and it'd be really clear. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I actually agree. It would it would bring clarity to it. It wouldn't change any anything with respect to how the lottery operates now. It would codify it effectively. At the appropriate time, I'll make a motion. Very good, thank you. I, so I was gonna ask if you've got a place to put that and we can put it in an amendment. Okay, anyone else? All right, good. Um, if there's no other public comment or comment from the committee, we'll close the hearing and ask for a motion on the bill. Chair, I move the bill. Okay, it's moved. Moved by Connolly, seconded by Dayton. Um, now we have amendments. I guess the easier amendment was the one that uh, Mr. Kaufman had, if you want to. Um, does anybody have uh, ready for that? Do you have it ready, Mr. Uh, oh. Mr. Chairman, I'll, I'll get started so that we page just get Page two, moving. line 10. Yeah, page, I'll make the motion that on page two, line 10, yep. we uh, take out calendar. a calendar and put a fiscal year. Second. Well, let's, let's do all three of them in one motion. Okay. I'll have to share the responsibility. I was looking at the... Okay. Next one was... Um, where to go? I had it marked. Mr. Chairman, actually, the next one on page six is fairly substantive. They want to be able to extend without bid extensions of contracts that oh. do, in fact, materially change the terms. Okay. And that's not just a kind of a All scrivener's right. thing like we're going on page where's two. Where's the final one then? Yeah, okay, we'll skip that one. Where's the next one? Uh, Mr. Chairman, the, uh, the first one he had recommended was in the title. Oh, yes. Okay. And and you had a suggestion on the language on that, didn't you, Josh? Sure, Mr. Chairman. Um, uh, up to the committee, but instead of clarifying the types of games that may, may be conducted, uh, we could just say um, revising terminology. Okay. That would be part of my motion, okay. Mr. Chairman. So we have, there's two parts to Senator Case's motion. Does everybody understand that amendment? And I'll extend my second to the uh, friendly amendment that Senator Case accepted on page one. Okay, thank you. Accept your friendly extension. All in favor of this amendment, please say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion carried. Next item is the language on, um, I think if I understood Mr. Kaufman correctly, he's, uh, we have some subjectivity in here on, this is on page <laughs> number six, lines three and four and five, where it talks about materially different and the fact that one person's materially different might be different than another's and, and um, so forth, but that's where we are. Is there a motion on that? Go ahead, uh, 
Representative Obermiller. Oh, oh, you're ahead of us. Okay, I'm trying to get caught up with, to you. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I, I don't have a motion. I, I I'd actually would speak against that motion. I mean, if that would okay. be my opinion. Well, if there's yeah. nobody who wants to make a motion, we'll move on. Okay. Is there any other motions, any other amendments? Mr. Yes. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go to Mr. Obermuller. Mr. Obermuller. Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Page four, uh, line 18, due to some other changes in the language, uh, on line 18, page four, I want to drop the term minimum, the final reconciliation of the transfer to the state under this subsection. So just cross that's out minimum. That's, a, that's the amendment. One Second. Word. Seconded by Kimsky. Everybody understand it? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed no. Motion carried. Next item. Is there any more amendments? Mr. Chairman. Senator Case. Mr. Chairman, my motion is a little bit conceptual, but I would ask that we okay. uh, revise the bill draft to, uh, and the title to bring in those portions of the lottery statute that re re reference the Public Records Act. And uh, I don't believe the Open Meetings Act is referenced. And my goal is to get it in there so we can figure out um, uh, in essence, to be able to exempt them from some portions of it, but it needs to be in there. And that's the concept of the amendment, so that when we get this in the session, when we can't mm -hmm. move move the title or change the, it, something uh, outside the title, we'd be able to work on that. The goal would be to allow them to have open meetings just like they've been happening, mm -hmm. in compliance with the law, and for certain things like contracts and other secrets, and they have a list in their own law that talks about the secrets they're talking about, mm -hmm. that they could, they could go into executive decision for those purposes. And that's consistent with what they're doing. And I think it just clear everything up and everybody would, would be happy about that. Second. No, seconded by Kinski. Uh, Josh, do you have a, a pretty good understanding of what this conceptual uh, amendment entails? Okay. Anyone else? I, don't, I can't see it'll hurt anything. Do you guys see anything wrong? Okay. I think it'd be helpful for everybody. Yeah, it, it gives you something to hang your hat on if somebody has a issue. All right, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Motion's carried. Mr. Chairman. Yes. Another amendment. <laughs> Page three, lines 19 to 22, I'd move that we strike them in their entirety and then substitute in lieu thereof. The Wyoming Retirement System is authorized to host the a 401k plan for the Lottery Corporation. And not that exact language, Josh will clean it up so that it, it fits the actual legal description of the lottery. Just want to clarify that we're not going to also extend them to the state health insurance and to the uh, 457 and host the 401k. What, why would you want to do that? Well, anyway, is there a second to this? Okay. Seconded by Furphy. Uh, what's what what uh, is the purpose of that? Well, Mr. Chairman, this says that they're going to go on to the state insurance plan. I don't. Are they on the state insurance plan now? You 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 can't foresee you'll ever want on it. Okay. And it says here they're going to go on to the Wyoming Deferred Compensation Act. They're not asking for that. They're not asking for a 457 plan. They just want to host for okay. the 401k and stay on the state retirement. Okay, if we just put a period after Retirement Act, does that, <coughs> is that sufficient? Mr. Kaufman would have to answer that, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Kaufman, if we just put a period after the Retirement Act, is that, is that inclusive of the 401k? Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry I can't give a more precise answer, but in my conversations with counsel for the Retirement Act, they, they requested either language Again, privately, it's a 401k, but I think this in, in state parlance, it's the 457. So okay. need some authorization to host it in, yeah. in that context. So I don't exactly know what language would satisfy that. Well, I think the first line and a half is what you need. You know, I, isn't that where you, where you see it? I'd, I'd modify my amendment accordingly, Mr. Chairman, to uh, just simply end it after Wyoming Retirement Act and put a period. Yeah, that, I think that'll work because it. The way it was before, it, uh, you know, it was okayed by them, um, and then the addition of these separate things isn't even covered by the Retirement Act. So, 
It's a good amendment. Anyone else have a question on this amendment? Otherwise, all in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. Motion carried. Is there any other amendments? If not, are we ready for the roll call? I guess we'll call, call for the roll, uh, Josh. Okay, Mr. Chairman, this is for 19 LSO 134 as amended. Senator Case. Aye. Senator Ellis excused. Senator Kinski. Aye. Senator Wasserberger excused. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Dayton. Aye. Representative Furphy. Aye. Representative Hallinan excused. Representative Kinner excused. Representative Larson excused. Representative Obermuller. Representative Paxson excused, uh, Co-Chairman Peterson. Aye. And Co-Chairman Madden. Aye. And uh, we'll just make a note there that we'll leave it open in the event that others would like to to uh, vote on it tomorrow, that who aren't here today. Senate file or House bill? Uh, what, do you, what do you think, folks? I used to have all kinds of say-so about this, but since I'm not going to be here next year, um, this could be a Senate file. And, and you know, here, here's what we do in the Revenue uh, Committee is that we have so many bills that do have to start in the House that the co-chair and I years ago decided all bills that could go to the Senate, we should try to focus, you know, to channel them there, but the one in, in favor of recognizing that so many have to come to the House anyway. So is it, I think we'll make it a Senate file. I think it should be, Mr. Chairman. Yep, good deal. Thanks for bringing that up. Appreciate it. Next item on the agenda, statewide stamping of cigarettes. We've got a bill. We had, thank you, everybody, for coming. Uh, thanks for all the work you did, and um, have a good day. You got a, a bill here. It's um, LSO0093, uh, I think, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, um, is there any um, uh, buddy here that wants to speak on this bill or maybe Josh, you should just tell us what constitutes or what, what the essence of this bill is. Again, we heard it, I think before, it hasn't been changed too much, has it? From what we uh, conceptually went through last uh, September, but go ahead. Sure, Mr. Chairman. So, yeah, as you know, we talked about this at our last meeting. Uh, it did not change at all uh, as a result of that meeting. Um, what this does is uh, directs the governor to begin negotiations with the uh, business councils of the, the two tribes to uh, enter into a compact um, to make ta tobacco taxes equivalent across the state. Um, and then it, it gives some, some direction in what might be included in that compact, but otherwise it's it's pretty general. And with that I'd I'd stay with any questions. Is there any questions that people have uh, on the committee uh, about the language of this bill? I've got one, but I'll wait until the rest of you are, Mr. Chairman, satisfied. Go ahead, Senator. Case. Um, just a little bit, you know. Um, this committee asked the Select Committee on Tribal Relations to uh, have it on their agenda as well, which we certainly did. Um, I think the thinking about it is fleshed out uh, um, quite a bit more, and I, Mr. Noble's here. Um, but here's one way that this could work, Mr. Chairman, is that um, all cigarettes in Wyoming would then be stamped, and then where they are sold, the entity that's where the cigarettes are sold would keep the tax revenues. So cigarettes sold on the reservation would be sold. It have the same uh, tax as cigarettes off the reservation, mm -hmm. but that the the uh, sovereign nations of the reservation would be able to mm -hmm. uh, uh, keep the tax and use it mm -hmm. in ways they see fit. Um, and off off the reservation, it's the same way it is now. The good thing about this is it could lead to a situation. Right now, we in essence estimate how many cigarettes are sold on the reservation to non-Indians. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not exactly the best means. It, it also means that cigarettes are basically cheaper on the reservation than they are off, creating possibility, um, um, you know, so you got a tribal member that buys cigarettes off, they don't pay the tax, or are off the reservation, they pay the tax, 
they they pay they don't pay it on the reservation and you have uh, non-natives that are supposed to be paying it on the reservation but sometimes basically cigarettes are cheaper on the reservation so what this means is that we don't care what color the skin of the person that buys cigarettes is we we uh, we only have to keep track of where they're sold and it could be two separate tax stamps um, uh, or one entity could, the state could contract with it to tribes or the tribes could contract with the state to tax the cigarettes. They could be different colors if they want. They could say different things on the tax, but the taxes are the same. Yeah. You know, that's, that's where this goes. And uh, um, councils have been through elections since we had this discussion with them. Um, and I'm, and they were, um, they thought it was worth exploring. Let me, give, let me give you that. But there have been changes. There's changes in the leadership of both councils. I don't know for sure where it's going to go. Um, but uh, the last thing I'll say about the bill is this bill respects the tribal entities as as sovereign entities, and the and the, the governor's off. The governor would be involved in uh, directing the negotiations. The bills that we had previously that talked about just equivalent taxes basically said um, we're not going to change ours until you change yours and we didn't address it as a sovereign uh, government to government discussion that's very important to the tribal governments and this bill tries to do that I'll shut up <laughs> anyone else want to speak uh, representative Connolly yeah thank you thank you mr. chairman and I'm not sure if this is a question for Josh or for um, senator case first of all I, I appreciate the bill. I mean, I think the bill does exactly what it moves us in the direction that we've been talking about for a year now. But on page two, line seven, I had kind of a question mark thinking about it's the, where it says the compact may include provisions for allocating tobacco tax revenues. And I was curious if we needed to be more specific there or if everything, honestly, that you just said, Senator Case, <laughs> is taken in that phrase, allocating tobacco, tobacco tax revenue. Do we need to say to the tribes, to the localities, to the state or not? Is it broad enough? Off, but comp what you just said. But really, that's my question. Do you think the language is good enough to do all of what you just said? Because that's the only place that I see how that discussion would, would take place, yeah, is before, in that phrase. And I think before Senator Case talks, I'd like to, I think you have a good point there that I did put a note when I at home here when, year, weeks ago when I first looked at this, but under B on page two, it, it looks like it's a little bit loose, and, and if I was a governor, I wouldn't know just what what we were talking about. And so I made this note. I said, do we want to prescribe that uh, taxes uh, arising from reservation sales stays in the reservation, and that taxes arising outside the reservation stays with the state of Wyoming? And that, to me, is the crux of of what will make this compact work, you know, that we have, we take the unambiguity unambiguity out of who gets what when. It's just plain. If you sell a cigarette on the reservation, you that amount of revenue goes to you and so forth. But, K Kale, what do you uh, see here, um, Mr. Chairman? Um, I think it's fine the way it is, but um, I'm not really opposed to the more language that says taxes are a, kind of a bill and keep kind of thing. You get to keep them where they are. But I'd like to hear from Mr. Noble if he thinks this language works or, or not. And don't mean to put yeah, you on the will. spot, Mr. Noble, but. Um, no, we will need to have, to have and, uh, testimony. Mr. Noble, uh, he'll be involved in this no matter what. So, Mr. Noble. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. I'm Dan Noble, Director of the Department of Revenue. Um, the, the language itself in paragraph B, starting on line six, um, doesn't really describe the way things are done today. Obviously, we base what we do on where the cigarettes are sold. So I don't know that it really speaks to what I think would, norm would actually be contemplated with this. But it does 
I mean, it does say may include provisions for allocating tobacco tax. I, I guess I would say that I'd almost want to leave it out and say and say that negotiate a a contract with the tribes that basically describes how this will be done as opposed to offering it up saying it may not be associated with sales. I think that almost implies that regardless of where the um, cigarettes are sold, there's going to be a certain amount of tax that goes to everybody. That's almost negotiated here, you know, you know, the, the tax, everybody gets something. And I really think this is, and at least the way it was presented in the tribal relations committee was if it's sold on the reservation, you're going to keep the revenue. I think that was really kind of the way it was viewed is that um, rather than having these, these agreements where we say, okay, of the taxes that are generated on the reservation, how much of it is sold uh, on cigarettes that are sold to non-Native Americans versus Native Americans, that's about as arbitrary as you can imagine. And really what this, I think what was contemplated was if it's sold on the reservation, it's going to be retained that th those stamps are going to designate that as reservation sales and that tax will go to the reservation. We already track the amount of cigarettes that are sold on the reservation today. So it's not a, as if it would be difficult to do this. What we would do is, is either continue asking for that, those sales to be recorded and then just uh, distribute that money to the tribes or actually stamp those cigarettes using a different stamp so that it's specifically identifiable as a reservation stamp and 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 make it happen that way. It wouldn't be difficult because quite frankly, all we did look for is a different color stamp or something like that for, for identifying them and identifying them. But we already know how many unstamped cigarettes are sold on the reservation today. And in order to get to capture any revenue, we basically enter into these arbitrary agreements. Mr. Chairman, go ahead, Senator Case. Um, would you be thinking about something like the compact may include provisions for the retention of taxes by appropriate governments on and off the Wind River Reservation According and ensure to that the tobacco taxes are equivalent across the state of Wyoming? Something like that. I mean, a little bit more refinement. Hmm. You work on that. It, as long as you key it to, so we get rid of the arbitrariness. Right, you know, I see what you're saying. We need, we need I to think have it's a good change. Whatever sold. I think the tribes will like that too. Yeah, of course they will. That way they walk out of there and they know what they're going to end up with. Whatever cigarettes were sold in the boundary of the reservation, it's their revenue. Be thinking of um, uh, the proper terminology, the okay. proper language for this uh, amendment, please. I'll be working okay. on this. Anyone else? All right. Do you have anything else to add, uh, Mr. Noble? No, okay. I do not. All right. Is there any other state agency that would like to speak on this? Is there any any other member of the public who would like to speak on this? Oh, here we've got somebody. A introduce yourself and who you represent, please. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mark Larson with the Wyoming Petroleum Marketers Association. We were. Uh, originally brought this issue uh, up uh, after we looked at, in 2011, uh, Mr. Noble did a study and it was a, a good study that clearly demonstrated the benefit would be in the tribe's interest if we went this direction. Uh, it took a little time to get there and we as an association are just seeking parity with the reservations in terms of uh, tobacco products and we think this is a good way to, to go. I want to commend uh, Senator Case and uh, Representative Larson on the admirable job, admirable job they did in the Select Committee on Tribal Relations in getting both of the chairmen to say on record that they were in agreement moving forward with this concept. Uh, we obviously believe that this is a, a good direction to go. We need the tribe's involvement in it, and, and hopefully the uh, Attorney General will be able to come up with uh, a, a good plan. There, there's not unprecedented in Wyoming uh, compacts that have struck a deal similar to this because there is a gasoline compact that works exactly the same. So we think there's definitely a benefit in this for the tribe. Uh, Twelve other states have, have also uh, exacted a statewide tax and then struck a deal with the tribes for them to retain that that uh, revenue. There's definitely a benefit in the tribe. There's definitely a benefit in the state. So with that, I'll take any questions and thank for committee for moving us forward. Okay, thank you for your comments. Is there any questions for, to uh, Mr. Larson? Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. <clears throat> Anyone else? 
Oh, could you introduce yourself and who you represent? <clears throat> Uh, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, Mike Mosier, Wyoming State Liquor Association. I am especially happy to take this opportunity to actually support something. Uh, and I commend the work, as Mr. Larson did, uh, that has been done by Senator Case and his colleagues. Uh, this is truly an issue we've been working at since 2011. Uh, it actually started in kind of a roundabout way. And I think I've explained to, this, the, to the committee before, so I'll keep it brief. But part of it was there were multiple attempts at municipal uh, option on alcohol taxes to pay for substance abuse uh, issues, especially out of Fremont County. And the problem is it doesn't raise any money and the administrative cost didn't outweigh anything else. And so I started thinking there has to be a way because we've trained over 34,000 people with the liquor division in responsible alcohol training. Substance abuse is a serious issue. And I thought there has to be a way to generate revenue without raising taxes. And so I started doing some homework and found out about these tribal compacts. Uh, contacted the governor's office. Ironically, the uh, or interestingly, the policy analyst that I worked with is now one of our five statewide elected officials, uh, and the governor presented it to the tribes in 2011. Uh, those of you who know me well know that I'm a painfully eternal optimist, so I just assumed it was such a great idea that they'd just move on its own. Well, it's been seven years, so obviously that didn't work so good. But I'm tickled that the issues come came back up. Like I said, the retail parity, uh, I agree with Mr. Larson that that's important. Cross-border sales of, of cigarette products are, are a major issue. But also it creates a funding source for the tribes to be able to fund things like substance abuse issues, since we do have those issues in Fremont County. And so I, I support this issue. Uh, once again, I'm, th I'm thankful we finally saw it. I've always heard it takes three attempts to uh, pass good legislation, but since it's been seven years, this has been even longer. Uh, but I'm happy we're moving forward with it, and I'll be glad to take any questions. Any questions for Mr. Moser? <clears throat> Seeing none, thank you very much for coming. Thank you. <clears throat> Anyone else? Anyone else want to speak from the public? Okay. If that's the case, we'll close public hearing. And um, and um, what's your wishes on the bill, committee? Okay, we have a motion that uh, came simultaneous with... Uh, first and second. Okay. First came from Senate Representative Connolly. Second came from Kinsky then. And... Um, What's your, uh, your wish? Is there any amendments on the bill? You want to go through it, page or you know, paragraph by paragraph, or how do you? We've got that amendment. Oh, Senator Case has got an amendment. So listen up, folks. Uh, hmm? Mr. Chairman, it would be page two. It's in section B, lines six through nine, and um, let me read it all the way through as it as it would read first. It would be the new B would read. The compact may include provisions for the retention of tobacco tax revenue by appropriate governments on and off the Wind River Reservation and ensure that tobacco taxes are equivalent across the state. And it doesn't talk about the fixing of stamps, but I don't think we need to go in there. Oh, so it, it uh, doesn't preclude it. Yeah. yeah. All right. We have I, and I've already given it to Josh. I think he's got it. Okay, good. Thank you for that extra work. Uh, it was moved by Senator Case and seconded by Connolly. And I would give leeway if there's some tweaking to the language that need to be done. Um, <laughs> but I think Wind River Reservation is the right term, and, and so I think it's ready. Okay, anything else? All right. Uh, let's uh, question on amendment. Call for the question on the amendment. All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Bowes, no. Motion carried. Uh, any other amendments anyone has? If not, uh, could you call the roll, please, Josh? Yeah. This, is for this is for 19 LSO 93 as amended. This Senator Case. Aye. Senator Ellis, excuse. Senator Kinski. Senator Wasserberger excused. Representative Connolly. Aye. Representative Dayton. Aye. Representative Furphy. Aye. Representative Hallinan. Aye. Representative Kinner excused. Representative Larson excused. Representative Obermuller. Representative Paxson excused. Uh, Co-Chairman Peterson. Aye. And Co-Chairman Madden.
Hi. Now, you'll see on your agenda that, you know, I put the House, 2018 House Bill 43 as kind of a companion, and that was the, uh, in, in speaking with, God, must have been two months ago with, with uh, Senator, or Representative Harshman, he thought that we, we should have a companion bill in to raise the fee on taxes. But when I look at uh, page of the bill we just approved, uh, item C says the compact includes a process detailing how to propose, how to approach any potential revisions to the tobacco tax if requested by one or more parties. So I guess the way I feel, the way that uh, us dealing with an increase in the cigarette tax simultaneous with trying to negotiate this uh, uh, contents of this bill would be counterproductive. What's the rest do you think? Agreed. <coughs> okay. Yeah, you know, that was not, you know, it was not a situation where we we're planning on getting too far in the weeds here, but I think after we have a compact, then it's the appropriate time to start talking about whether <laughs> both groups think that the tax rate is appropriate or not. So uh, if that's okay, we'll move on to the next item on the agenda. And I, I put this on the agenda, not, not real clear on what, where, where we're gonna go. This is a corporate tax. Or do we wanna take a break, folks? If you want to, we got a little, we, we gained some time. So if you want to take a 10 minute break, we can do that. The last bill will be a Senate file. Yeah, the last bill will be a Senate file also. Thank you. 10 minutes? <coughs> okay, 10 minutes. Yeah, try to get back here by the bottom of the hour so we don't get out of whack on our time. We need.
So let's gather around and we'll uh, talk about the next item. I don't know how much time we want to spend on it. We did have a presentation from, was it the Council of State Legislature, Legislators that, uh, yeah, that were, uh, was. Didn't really take any specific action that day as to what we want to do. Uh, it's probably a little bit uh, early to be talking about, uh, you know, changing our tax structure uh, too much in this in this regard as far as the corporate tax. But I think um, uh, Representative Obermiller had a special interest in this and has. Oh, you have you're going to present as a witness, huh? All right, uh, Representative Obermiller, uh, I'll turn it over to you and you can tell tell us what uh, you have in mind or what. All right, thank you. Um, I wanted to just take a minute to put some uh, context around uh, what's going on since this is not being presented as a committee bill, but it's an idea that we're trying to push forward and I'm trying to push forward. So I wanted the committee to be aware of what's going on with this issue uh, and so my I have a few just opening comments to kind of put this uh, topic in some historical context uh, in the face of a budget shortfall in 1969 uh, Governor Stan Hathaway went to the legislature and said you've got to do something that something he was talking about was a severance tax on energy producers 2019 marks the 50th anniversary of the passage of the severance tax. Today, nearly 40% of government-wide activity, activities are paid for by severance taxes along with the earnings from the Permanent Mineral Warming Trust Fund. Governor Hathaway in the 40th legislature set the cornerstone for taxation of interstate commerce. Now, 50 years later, it's time to add another stone to that foundation. I see the rapid development of interstate taxation policies all around us and conclude, as the legislature did 50 years ago, we've got to do something. How does Wyoming stand in relation to other states? I'm here to tell you that interstate commerce is paying state income or revenue taxes to every state except Wyoming, with our one exception of energy producers. And South Dakota has targeted application. Other than that, every state. It gets worse. I see more states moving to include Wyoming income on their state tax returns. Over half of the states currently do that. States identify where companies from their state work and whether it is subject to taxation in that other state. If it is not, they include that income on their own state return. The largest retailer in our state comes from the state that includes Wyoming generated revenue on their home state return. Looking forward, I see the expansion of nexus in the definition of nexus that states apply to include things like internet sales and their income tax collections. You know, we've been through this with the sales tax piece of this, but the income tax part of it is, is different, runs on a different track. But the, the nexus of trying to grab revenue from other places will continue. So for Wyoming, it's a policy decision. Wyoming can continue to hold its current position or we can actively insert ourselves into the conversation in our own self-interest and begin to claim our share of the tax dollars, which are currently distributed to a large degree to other states. In my opinion, the time when passivity as a viable option in interstate taxation has passed. We must engage this. And regardless of the current estimate of potential revenue be, to be generated, we are establishing a framework for the future here. Like 50 years ago, we can't foresee all the challenges we will face, but for sure tax policy will be part of that future. I'm working on a bill with LSO staff. It is in partial draft, you know, partial draft form today, 
and I would like you to know the basic framework here this, this afternoon. It will be based on a model bill called the Multi-State Compact, developed by an association of states called the Multi-State Commission. Most of our immediate neighbors are compact members. Wyoming currently is an associate member. The specific application we're modeling after uh, at this point is North Dakota, since they have similar characteristics to us. But the Wyoming specific provisions uh, are, are generally like this. It would be a net income tax derived from federal taxable net income. It will apply to companies with more than 100 shareholders, which is primarily publicly held companies. Uh, that particular number is based on the fact that once you pass that threshold of 100 shareholders, uh, that is when you are required to file your taxes as that entity. You can no longer pass through your income to individuals. So it's an entity level tax. Uh, the, the bill contemplates tax credits for other taxes paid, such as severance, property sales, excise taxes, insurance premium taxes, and the like. Uh, the rates would be comparable to surrounding states. Uh, it would contemplate the use of a three-factor apportionment system consistent with the multi-state tax compact model bill. Uh, it would begin with fiscal years beginning after December 15th, 2019, which basically means the year 2020. And uh, the tax would be due to, as it is in typical state arena, the 15th day of the fourth month, meaning it's an April 15th filing deadline. So if, if that bill were passed in this session, the first collection would be April 15th of 2021. Yeah, that completes my presentation, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I'm open for questions. Well, thank you very much. That was that was informative. And and uh, is there uh, any questions you have for uh, Mr. Obermuller? We'll get uh, uh, finance up here too. But maybe I got some questions. If you the bill that you you have got in mind, do you have a uh, a rough estimate of what it would what it would bring in a year, or do you have a a rate? Is it co comparable to some of these rates that have been set in other states, or how? I, I what, do not I do not have any rate set. Uh, the as I testified, it uh, most likely will be some type of rate comparable to our neighbors, which put. Uh, but, but I don't know that yet. I'm still uh, talking to a lot of people about how it impacts hmm. their particular business and what a, what a rate for Wyoming ought to look like. So uh, I hesitate to put a number on it today because I just don't well, know. Yeah, and that's, I just want to know what you have. Another question would have been, you know, I, I looked through all the states, and you're right, most of them have this a similar type of, of a corporate tax. But uh, when you look at... Um, you know, I guess two states that are close to us is Montana and and um, North Dakota. And Montana collects 120, could have collect 60 million. And it envisioned it with that conflict in state corporations would have a deduction of, of their excise tax and their property tax, which they don't have. I would say that our our collections are probably in the neighborhood of, you know, if the, if the rate was somewhere in the ballpark of them, it'd be like 40 or 50 million. If it more more closer to 50 million, if it was like Montana's rate and closer to 35 or 40, if it was North Dakota's rate. But it's because we're so much narrower, and because we we have that de deduction that that smaller corporations would enjoy, and, and as well as big ones. But um, you know, when you compare that to the amount of revenue from a, well, it's, that's equivalent to about a quarter of a percent sales tax. Three, 
to a fourth of the patient is whether it's, it's even worth it, but it must be worth it because 48 other states are doing it. But yet, you have any remarks on that? Well, uh, yeah, I do. I think uh, this is this is the one tax where the the um, energy producers have a stake in this. This is the one tax that is going to be designed to be neutral in that in that world. So it extends it beyond them. It's it's uh, it takes a tax that is exclusively theirs and broadens it to a broader corporate world. Uh, it claims our share of whatever amount it is that's being collected by somebody else. Uh, that uh, when you throw around a number like 50 million, I'm pretty optimistic about that. I don't know of any other kinds of bills we get through here that can generate that kind of money. I'd be good to know. Uh, uh, Director Noble is here today, and, and I've asked him to look at that specific issue, so maybe he's a better one to talk to about that. Mm -hmm. I've been looking at it from a policy standpoint more than at this at this level, uh, uh, not really knowing how to calculate what it would bring in. I think it's a difficult calculation to make, but from a policy standpoint, it makes sense. So uh, I'll defer to Director Noble if he has some insights. Yeah, he may have some. The other questions I'd have was like the start, startup costs and the ongoing costs of auditing and personnel and collection. I don't even know anything about it, but. Uh, yes, Mr. Chairman, I've asked uh, Director Noble to take a look at those items too. So yeah. hopefully, well, maybe we'll some get light. Mr. Noble up here to talk about it for a while. Are you any questions for uh, Representative Obermiller before he? Ms. Ms. Chairman, where'd that come Sweeney. from? Sweeney. Oh, so, okay. Ms. Representative Sweeney. If if, if I could, uh, if appropriate, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask a question. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Representative Obermuller, do you have a feeling um, Wyoming-based companies, um, would the Secretary of State have information? Um, I, I, I can think of a, a couple, but I think they're family-owned, based in Casper, um, but that probably won't fall in this category. But do you have a feel if this really would affect uh, Wyoming-based uh, companies because of the provision um, of the 100, 100 shareholders and C-Corp aspect. Uh, Mr. Chairman, <clears throat> Representative Sweeney, I do not know that answer. I suspect that uh, we will be finding that out as we move forward. Uh, the voices that represent maybe that segment will be speaking to this, but I do not know of any of uh, of those examples uh, mr chairman a follow-up go ahead uh, with the secretary of state's office through uh, business filings be able to compile such a list do you think the way in which we gather that information could you address that uh, mr chairman representative sweeney i do not know okay Anyone else? Let's get Mr. Noble up and see if he's got some wisdom here for us. <laughs> Mr. Noble, welcome again. Good afternoon again, Mr. Chairman. Dan Noble is the Department of Revenue. Um, I did take a look. And I, and I think it was really important to look at a, a state that is very similar to, to what we have in place today, similar um, ge you know, um, demographics. And, and I think uh, North Dakota makes sense in that respect. Yeah. The, and, I'll, and I'll run down the tax calculations for North Dakota. In 2014, which as we all know, that was a, a pretty good year for uh, oil and gas. Um, $239 million was generated in um, corporate income tax in the, in the state of North Dakota. Uh, three years later, I should say 2016, $97 million um, was yeah. generated. Um, so you can imagine that the mineral industry has a very large impact on, on their corporate income tax in, in the state of North Dakota. 
However, I don't think that would necessarily be the case for the state of Wyoming. When you look at what um, our constitution provides for, we are required um, in the constitution to offer an offsetting credit, and I'm not, not a deduction, a credit, which is a dollar for dollar reduction in tax for any sales or property taxes that are paid. Half of what is paid by the mineral industry outside of severance tax is property tax on the mineral itself. They also are very heavy contributors to the sales tax revenue in the state. Modeling that will be somewhat difficult. I have a little bit of experience in it um, from trying to do it on the personal income tax. Um, there are statistics available um, for how much average sales tax and property tax is paid by individuals on the personal income tax side. So I utilize those numbers. And in order to generate $150 million in revenue, um, the state of Wyoming had to have roughly an 8% uh, income tax on individuals. I think it, the, well, what, we, what you'll see is in order to generate revenue, the tax, the, the, the initial tax rate will have to be higher. It doesn't necessarily mean that that's what will be paid because obviously those credits really reduce the ability to, to, to generate any tax revenue. Um, but I think you'll start off with a tax rate that is higher than it is in, in North Dakota. Their um, top rate is 4. Uh, North Dakota 4.31 percent and it is a um, scaled rate. There are a number of states that have flat rates. Um, but I think you're going to, you're, you're the, the, the real difficult aspect of this is going to be trying to model this. I don't think we can do so without actually having some data um, as to what the average taxes paid by C-Corps are in the state of Wyoming. Um, and, and that will so certainly help us in, in generating a model. But I think it's important to understand that it is different than it is in other states. Um, they, they offer a number of deductions in other states associated with the, with the income tax. Um, from the state of North Dakota's uh, website, I, um, virtually every state had some footnotes on how they're different as it relates to um, how they calculate their corporate income tax. Um, some of them offer uh, different, st different starting points as to when they begin taxable um, revenue. One of the things we'll have to do is we'll have to add back in deductions that are allowed under the federal code. If we're going to use taxable federal taxable income, we're going to have to add back in the, the sales tax and property taxes that are claimed as deductions under the federal code and then take them back out as credits. So that's difficult as well. Um, but I, what I want to do is, is work with some folks and see if I can't find a a method to model this because quite frankly, it's it's a little more complicated than the personal income tax is because the data is not as generic, if you will. Um, but it is something that is certainly um, doable. Um, it is one of those things that we're gonna have to spend a great deal of time either looking at it or um, potentially asking for reporting um, without taxation to find out where it will ultimately end up. But it is a process that is um, it's done in other states, and most uh, most other states, as a matter of fact, um, have a corporate income tax. Even the state of Alaska um, has a corporate income tax. They don't have a personal income tax, but they have a corporate income tax. Mm -hmm. So it's um, certainly something um, that that we can investigate. Um, the the from from a <coughs> Um, administration standpoint, obviously you're going to need a need forms. You're going to need um, a system to manage this coming in. I would hope that we would be able to create this something that is um, heavily electronic in its implementation because that would minimize the the staffing that would needs for it. Um, and in most states, that's pretty much how most of it is handled. Um, 
it, I mean, what used to be paper paper world is is be becoming predominantly electronic now, and that certainly um, lessens the amount of human interaction as it relates to the the forms themselves and and getting the data into the systems. But it, uh, those systems are not cheap. Uh, the last time I looked at it at replacing the excise tax system, which would probably be roughly similar to what we're looking at now, is around five million dollars um, to put it in place. There are off-the-shelf products that are fairly um, easy to get up and running, um, but they're not without a um, without uh, substantial cost associated with them to get them up and then maintaining them as well. Um, as far as human capital goes, you're going to end up needing auditors and you're going to end up needing some staff to manage the uh, process. We, we are a tax collection agency, so I think we can probably um, um, minimize the the, the amount of staffing, but it isn't going to be without some level of cost as well. Um, if if this moves forward, this is an exercise we'll probably have to spend a great deal of time in investigating as to what, what the cost will actually be. Um, but um, just to give you an idea, um, the last time I replaced the excise tax system was roughly $5 million for the replacement. And um, those numbers are not going down, I can tell you that. And I'll stand for any questions you may have. Do you have any questions for Dan? Do you have another one? Yes, Mr. Chairman, if I could. Representative. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. To, to study it and do this properly, if this moves forward, are you talking three years? Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Representative Sweeney, I think I'd probably have to, to talk to some, some experts to see if there's a way to model this without having to um, ask for reporting from people and things like that. One of the things that I think would be good to, to know is just exactly how big the universe of C-Corps that file in Wyoming actually are. Yeah. And I think I, I think that there is a segregation of C-Corps versus LLCs and, and, and S-Corps that is, that is maintained by the Secretary of State. So I think we could at least get the, the count of the number of corporations that we're dealing with. Um, then the question becomes, um, how do you how do you model that yeah. when in fact we're looking at something different than other states do other states don't have this issue of credit for all sales tax paid it is a deduction off of the return mm -hmm. and that, one of the things that makes it so easy for a number of states is they can take federal taxable income and tax it makes it easy um, if you offer credits outside of what the federal taxable income is it's a it's a little more difficult but you still have a fairly simple process if you start with adjusted gross income at the federal level and create your own deductions then you're pretty much like the feds are and you 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 basically st your starting point mm -hmm. has its own set of deductions that are on on the form and you see both um in the in the mm -hmm. states that do this they they handle it different ways a number of different ways and they have their own set of credits that they offer as well Well, yeah, thank you. Any other questions? You know, I think I keep coming back to this, you know, that <clears throat> the data I have here for 2017 <clears throat> is North Dakota collected $60 million, um, dollars, uh, $61 million. I've, I've got, um, this came off of their website, okay. and it was the latest one that they have for, for it's kind of an aggregation of all um, um, all states and, and how they compare to North Dakota. Yeah. Um, 2017 shows $68,383,000, but that is an estimate, meaning that they probably didn't have the entire year's worth of, of data in there. Or vice the, versa. Yeah, the, the one that was com completely done that really surprised me is how much it dropped off between 14 and 16 from $239 million to $97 million in, in a, in a <clears throat> two-year time frame is amazing yep. and if it if two if 68 million is really close then <laughs> that's even worse well yeah and that's that makes me think that they've com, kind of combined their mineral tax or actually started with the mineral tax and extended it to this peripheral areas and you know that's a different thing but just looking at you know if we take a, a low water point when when minerals were down in North Dakota and it come up with 60 million and to me it is relevant and what it cost to to 
audit it and how to, you know, when, when you take and reduce the size of Wyoming down to this, um, in proportion to where North Dakota is, I can't see there's more than 30 or $40 million, especially considering all these deductions that, that uh, are going to come right off the top. Those are the first dollars we lose. And, um, but that's fine. I mean, I'm all for somebody going out and investigating this. And the only thing I had on this item, and then I'll shut up, was that, you know, maybe you need an appropriation in the revenue department to go out and come up with seems answers because I can't see going in, diving into this without knowing what these uh, administrative costs are plus what the ballpark range of the collection is. Um, Mr. Chairman, might I suggest that we do a little digging ourselves first? I mean, that's kind of what we do anyway. So um, we'll look to see what this exercise would look like, find out if it's been done by other states. I'll, I've got some folks I can contact and see if, if they um, went through this exercise years ago when they did it. Um, and check with economic analysis, see if there's any way to model this okay. um, and see if we can if, if we can avoid having to appropriate funds to do it or or at least give you an idea as to what that would be. That sounds good. Yeah. That would be good. Anyone else? Do you have something to add? Uh, go ahead, Representative. Oh, did you have something? Sorry. Question. Go ahead. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Let me ask Dan, what, what I would really like to see is we need to tax those corporations that are not domiciled in Wyoming, but are pulling income out. Mm -hmm. How do you track that? And is that possible to go after those yeah. companies? Go ahead if you want to answer that. Um, Mr. Chairman, I, I think that you would probably run a foul. Let's put it this way. If you, if you tried to create a tax that says I'm only going to tax you if you don't if you don't have a physical presence here. Um, in the sales tax realm, we just got through with a case that uh, had a lot to do with that very issue, and I think you'd probably have a challenge as it relates to a discriminatory tax that may interfere with interstate commerce in doing so. So I, I think it would be um, something to at least to investigate, but I think. The, the way that you'd probably have to look at it is that if you don't have much of a physical presence in here, but you come into the state and you have no property, you're not going to receive the level of credit that you will if you have those items and you, and you are paying property taxes and sales taxes in the state. So that's probably, and that's, that's perfectly fair to say, if you don't have these, these um, tax right to, to receive a credit for them as well. So I think that's reasonable. But if you um, if you are paying these taxes in this state, then I think that's really where our constitution would would offer more protection, if you will, from from a tax like this. Hey. <clears throat> Anyone else? Did you have any concluding comments? I, I mean, uh, yes, I do, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, just to bring this full circle, you know, I have never framed this in terms of solving being the solution to our budgetary problems, either in the past or going forward. It's one piece of a bigger puzzle. It's a matter of balance and fairness in our tax system. And that's the whole point of this. So, so trying to model how much money as if the goal is, well, if it doesn't solve all of our problems, then we shouldn't do it. Uh, that's not where this is going. This is saying that that retailer who has come into our state that's the largest retailer in the state and is paying the taxes that they owe us to somebody else, that that's a problem to be solved in its own right, yep. regardless of all these studies. No, I agree. And I wish you luck on your, on your bill. And, and um, I'm sure the revenue committee will be keeping track of that as it makes its way through the, through the re legislative process and it will go through the, It'll go through the Revenue Committee as a committee. Yeah, thank you very bill. much, Mr. Yeah. Chairman and Chairman committee you. for yeah. listening. Oh, yeah, Co-Chairman, go ahead. Oh, thank you, Representative Overmuller, and I commend you for your efforts on this and your your work. Uh, spoken like a true 
a revenue uh, committee mem member. Yep. But uh, and I would hope I would go a step further, Mr. Co-Chairman, and, and I hope that this stays on the agenda of the revenue committee. This is one of those yep. things, and we all like to compare ourselves with other states. And in this particular case, we're an outlier. I mean, mm -hmm. we stand alone. Um, and that's not a good thing uh, when it comes to tax revenue and, and the problem that Wyoming faces as far as our dependency on our minerals and severance. So uh, we always talk about diversifying our tax revenue streams. But then when we come to an idea like this, well, it's hard. It's hard. And, and my, my position has always been it's always hard. And uh, for a representative to come forward with an idea such as this, uh, I hope the revenue committee, the future revenue committees, keeps this on the radar and keeps this uh, – um, on the forefront as one of those, as, as we look at assets, as far as revenues are concerned, tax options that Wyoming has, they're, they're few and far between. Uh, we know income tax is probably at the bottom of the list, but this is definitely higher than income tax as, as a possibility. And we ought to take a serious look at it and, and continue that course and, and lay all options on the table. So I would hope this committee pursues this. Um, and the future chairman sitting next to me, but on the Senate side. Um, and I think we need to to stay the course on providing these options for the full legislature to consider. Unlike the tax reform uh, 2000, uh, I don't want it dying and, and uh, gathering information, letting the Department of Revenue uh, gather what they can. And then possibly if this bill <clears throat> is intended just to draw out those parties that would be involved in this tax, that would be interesting in itself. Mm -hmm. um, but also just to start the conversation and then possibly a bill in the future to appropriate money to further study and get mm -hmm. hard numbers nailed down. Um, and so this is this is the beginning. And uh, uh, But I commend the representative for, for bringing this forward, and I hope this committee mm -hmm. doesn't take the position of, of watching him hit the brick wall and then saying, boy, that looked like it hurt, and then backing off of it completely. Rather than doing that, I think our option as a revenue committee ought to be to continue to pursue it. And then with the option of looking at future funding for a study to nail these figures down uh, more uh, succinctly and, and um, give us a better idea. This is a, a one of those options that we we need to take a look at. You know, when you mentioned Representative Oldman or some of the things that uh, uh, other states, uh, half of our other states are doing, to uh, tax dollars that were generated in, in Wyoming. That, that concerned me a little bit. Um, I've always said Wyoming's largest problem is the outgoing of revenue from our state. Uh, we don't keep it long enough in our state to generate a, a real benefit. And so this is one of those areas that, you know, a, a little pushback uh, I think is necessary from the state of Wyoming. And so revenue committee in the future, don't let this fall by the wayside. I, I would like to see it pursued and, and it'll be baby steps as usual. But um, again, thank you representative for bringing it forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, go ahead, Chairman, Co-Chairman Peterson. Uh, yeah, thank you for your comments. Uh, as Chairman of the Revenue Committee, Co-Chairman, uh, you made a statement that really resonated with me when people ask you, "Why does this keep coming up?" And your answer was, "So that our knowledge stays fresh. It comes back. Maybe it doesn't pass this time." or for a long time, but our knowledge on the subject stays fresh mm -hmm. so that when the time comes and the time is right, if needed, uh, we're ready to step in with something we know something about. So thank you very much. Yep. And the other good thing about this tax is that, you know, it's already, it's already there. I'm sorry, it's being collected in Arkansas or some other state, and we're just saying, well, we don't need it. You just go help yourself to it, and that's that really rankles me. You know, I think that this this has uh, got to stop, and you know, I wish you uh, good fortune and luck in getting this through. So, and if anybody can do it, it's you. Mr. Yes, go ahead, uh, Representative Helen. In thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I like this idea because. It really doesn't represent a tax increase right. on any of these entities. Uh, it just represents moving this money that's going out of our state to our state, and I think that's a very good, uh, a very good idea. So, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, thank you. All right. If there's nothing left on this uh, item, we'll move to uh, a report. Uh, I think it was in 2017. Uh, we have had a bill to uh, ask the uh, 
Revenue Department to investigate um, discounted cash flow as a way of, of measuring uh, ad valorem taxes for minerals. And they've been working on that off and on and, and mostly on. And um, there is a, a requirement, which is good, that, that they come and tell us what an update is and what the future is and where we are on this. This bill said that we, ha we have certain uh, what landmarks we have to hit or should hit. And that's what we want to hear about. And do we have, uh, are you ready for that, uh, Dan? Oh, we got... We got the uh, mineral man here too, so. Mel Welcome, Mr. Grandvik. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> Go ahead, the floor is yours. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, Dan Noble again with the Department of Revenue. Um, as you'd mentioned, we were tasked with um, studying um, whether or not discounted cash flow um, would be a appropriate mechanism for um, dealing with some of the issues we have with the um, property tax, the mineral industry, and how we're valuing it today, specifically oil and gas. And uh, um, we went through a process um, that Craig will describe in some detail. Um, to try to come to a conclusion as to whether this would be an, an, an effective way of altering our valuation of the minerals for property tax purposes to avoid some of the swings that, that the uh, counties feel when, when it comes to um, uh, notice evaluation changes that constantly create a moving target for trying to budget on, on the property tax side. Um, we went through a process of of investigating through other states that currently do this. Um, we utilize some of the same software products that those, those states utilize in um, calculating discounted cash flow for their industries. We received input from, from the mineral industry to try to look at um, the, the taxes that would be generated methodology. Um, and came to a conclusion. Um, I'm going to let Craig talk through talk you through the um, process, and then we'll talk about our conclusion at the, at the end of that. But uh, at this point, um, I, I guess well, I'm I'm actually going to let the cat out of the bag. It <laughs> does not uh, <laughs> it does not look as if discounted cash um, is is uh, going to be a, a a mechanism that is going to work. And um, I'll let Craig talk through the data, and then we can come back to why why we feel that way at this point. Okay. Go ahead, Craig. Thank you. Go ahead, Craig. Mr. Chairman, members of the committee, uh, thank you for having me this afternoon. Uh, as you know, this legislation um, started out just as Mr. Noble had uh, described. And the, the first step really was the Petroleum Association Wyoming Tax Committee. They sent out a rally cry to their members to see who would who would participate in this study because we were missing lease operating expenses. From our tax returns, we had all the other data we needed. Um, and like Mr. Noble had said that uh, we had contracted with the company that does discounted cash flow. Um, they actually provide the software for the state of Utah that we went to see how they performed it. So the uh, we had about uh, five mineral companies that provided quite a bit of data. It was a bit of a cross section. We had some companies that were doing some of the new horizontal drilling, as well as some of the companies that had the old overthrust, heavily processed gas. We were we were excited with kind of that cross section um, to take a look at new as well as old. Uh, the lease operating expenses came through in cost reports, and they were voluminous. It, it was a lot of work rolling through there. Um, making sure that the expenses that were included in those cost reports should be included. So we gathered that data, kind of sifted through it, and got it in into a format that could be uploaded into the software. Well, there was a bit of a learning curve on the department's part to try to get all that information properly into the software. And after a while, we cried uncle and said, hey, you know, we need, we need help um, from the company that um, – had provided the software and they, for a fee, they loaded up the information that uh, we had for them and they did the decline curves, which is a very important part of looking at 
um, the discounted cash flow, since it looks at the entire life of the reserves, the value of the reserves versus what we do in Wyoming, what's in each individual year. So they provided that data and looking at it, we kind of scratched our head and like, okay, this doesn't look right. Well, they had just provided one year's worth of calculation versus the entire life of reserve. And so back to the drawing board. And so they provided that information. So we got looking at it and they had provided many different discount rates and the discounted cash flow was always higher. Looking back, looking forward, looking life, it was just always higher than what our statutory. So the part of, we came up with a little spreadsheet model that you could input various variables and different decline curves and see what was going on. Well, the assumption was that eventually the two methodologies would equal one another. That didn't happen. It's amazing. Um, when you understand the concepts um, versus just think you know them, um, how, how obvious the results are when you understand how things work in conjunction with one another. So therefore, we knew that the discounted cash flow would always generate a higher value, two or three times, sometimes four times magnitude than what our, our current system does. So what do you do with that? We knew there had to be some type of adjustment that need, needed to be done. Um, so uh, this next go around with the legislation, we wanted to talk to an expert in industry that actually uses this and A, make sure that they agreed with our conclusion that discounted cash flow would always end up with higher value than our taxable um, statutes. And then B, is there a, a measure um, that can be used to, to try to get them in line with one another that actually makes sense? So. I think it's important to note that we also involve the industry as well as the assessors uh, along in this process to to see number one if if there was some insanity in our results that that uh, that, that were problematic. Um, the industry folks looked at, at their own data and said, "Yeah, it looks as if everything has been done." Um, we worked with uh, one of the industry experts that people that do this for a living. Um, and he's actually done a presentation here before um, to take a look at it and see, number one, if we did the, the, the if he saw any issues with the way the, the process was conducted. And, and also, if we could utilize a factor to create revenue neutrality associated with the values we came up with. And he basically stated that, number one, there's very good chance that the results that you got are what you're going to get. And that uh, any factor that you utilize to try to chase a number, which would be, be revenue neutrality, is very arbitrary and would not really follow the appropriate practice of valuing property in the first place. And that's kind of something that um, one of one of my administrators said all along that uh, you're probably chasing a number by doing this and it and it makes sense so really what we're left with is either the state has to try to develop a mechanism to um, lower that value using either the assessment ratio or something else to make it happen or it just is not going to be effective measure well based on the fact that you would have to do this for all minerals and remember to make it happen. You're never going to achieve revenue neutrality. And that's ultimately the conclusion that we came to is that while this is a great idea because number one, it stops all of the NOVC activity. It generates a tax that is probably not going to be acceptable being number, number one, because it is much higher than it would, than it would be today. And that obviously creates problems in and of itself. What we would like to do, because this study also wanted us to look at other methodologies, we'd like to continue this, not with funding. I think this is something that we'd want to work with the industry and, and the, uh, uh, the assessors on, continue that work um, and, and look for something that may have promise in another realm. I mean, there have been issues associated with trying to use index pricing. I think there's a lot of things for us to look at look to other states, see if there's something out there that we can do to, to minimize this burden and, and this, this, this wild fluctuations in value um, that we receive on a constant basis today. Um, I just 
wish I wish it had turned out differently, but it, I told you that, that when when we began this study that I, you were going to get the answer, whether it was something that was good or not. And quite frankly, we don't feel that it is going to um, provide a viable solution for what we were looking to do. And with that, it will stand for any questions you may have. Me. Is there any questions the committee has? Mr. Chairman, Better case. Um, Mr. Chairman, the only question, some states do use it. And how, how many use it? Well, we're aware of, of uh, two that utilize it for oil and gas. There are, as my understanding, as many as six that utilize it for coal. Um, but, but for oil and gas, um, Texas and Utah both utilize discounted cash flow. Mm -hmm. um, but they've used it for years. I think um, they started it back in the late 90s or in the early 2000s. I'll stand corrected if my dates are wrong, but in Utah, they, they made the conversion back uh, a long time ago. So, Mr. Chairman, just a slight follow-up. Go ahead. Um, a little later today, we're going to hear a um, presentation called Mineral Taxation in Wyoming Relative to Comparator States. Right. Mm -hmm. and Texas is one of those states. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering... How does their valuation methodology go into that comparison, and are, and are we have apples and apples, or is it <coughs> confusing that? And um, mm -hmm. I'll be interested in the answer to that question. Yep, it'll be coming up. Uh, my question is on, you know, if, when you say that the the discounted cash flow generates higher values, my sense is that it's higher. For one company, it might be two times higher. Another one might be four times higher. So, you know, they're all over the map. And, and revenue equality takes on a whole new dimension. Or revenue neutrality takes on a whole new dimension when you start getting involved with individual uh, firms. Um, so that Mr. Chairman, Matt, you're exactly right. It yeah. becomes a property by property right. adjustment. That, that'd be part so. of it. And, and the other part of it is, is you, you know, and I, I knew this the first in 2016 when we, <laughs> we, we started this study that in, in um, downswings, you know, we have amplitude. That's one of the things we thought we could get rid of is amplitude. But revenue neutrality takes a different dimension as we look at it through a cycle, a, a mineral cycle or something. And uh, at sometimes it might be four times too high. Sometimes, you know, to get when I'm talking about neutrality, right? And in that sense, discounted cash flow is not supposed to be revenue neutral. It's supposed to make it lower in the boom times and higher in the, so it's a smoother. It sounds like something that's too good to be true, and maybe it is. I don't know. But anyway, anyone else have a comment? Go ahead, Representative Furphy. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, obviously, um, one of the keys to a discounted cash flow is the discount rate that you're using. So, obviously, use the very low discount rate. And it's there's what Texas or another state's discount rate is. Um, Address that. I'll, I'll start at the thirty thousand foot level, and, and Craig can talk about how um, it's utilized today. Um, one of the things that that uh, you don't want to appear uh, when you establish a discount rate is arbitrary. And there's an awful lot that, of, of work. We, we went to the state of Utah when they were actually establishing those. And there is a lot of work that goes into it. And, and, and quite frankly, there's some negotiation with the companies associated with it. We do exactly the same thing with cap rate hearings um, for state assessed property. Um, but the other aspect of it is not just the discount rate, but you're not talking about a, a, a like a public utility that you're valuing that has a steady income stream. You're valuing a reservoir, if you will, that has a lot of production in the beginning and it tapers off. So you actually have to create a decline curve that, that mirrors what that production looks like over time and how that re reservoir is being depleted over that same period of time. So it's a little different exercise than a 
than a strict discounted cash flow. There is there are factors that you don't typically see if you're just valuing a company. What these folks do, and and the industry themselves uses this extensively when they when they start buying and selling properties. They got to know okay. This is what we think the known reserves are in this, in this reservoir, and this is what we think that property's, you know, value is in in determining what it is today. I think it's um, that was one of the things that was really difficult for us to get our arms around is okay, what do these decline curves look like? And as w as we've heard, those are starting to flatten out a little bit. I mean, they're they're getting better at getting this this uh, valuable resource out of the ground. And as they do so, those curves look a little different than they, than they did initially. But each year that you go back, you're at least gonna have another year of history of what that particular property looks like and how would its decline curve will look like as well. And I, I hate to say it, but that's kind of the art of valuing property anyway. And, and that's one of the things that um, I would like to say that we can create revenue neutrality. And, and obviously the term is something that the only thing that we have to go off of is, is what do we collect today? How do we make that neutral? Yeah. And in order to do that, the the conclusion that we der derived was you end up almost having to be arbitrary. And that's, I think, the last thing that, that, that we want to be perceived as being is, is arbitrary in the way that we assess these, uh, these properties. Okay. okay. So you're going to keep working on it another year and come back and see the revenue. Mr. Chairman, I hope we'll have a, a, a solution because, quite frankly, I'm getting sick and tired of signing NOVCs, to tell you the truth. Okay. <laughs> I do a lot of that. <laughs> I know you do. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for the report. Thank you. And um, now we'll go into the uh, – this. the next item is not intended to be a – item we take action on, but we're going to receive a report and hear a report, I should say, from uh, a, a, an individual that worked on comparing our mineral prices to other uh, comparable states. And we have Jason Beggar here with his consultant or our consultant. And uh, Jason, you've got the floor and you can introduce your people if you have them and we'll go from there. <clears throat> Welcome. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm Jason Bagger, the Executive Director of the Wyoming Infrastructure Authority, and joining me is uh, David Johnston with uh, Daniel Johnston and Associates. They are the uh, contract firm that uh, conducted the study. A um, little bit of background. Uh, this study was authorized in the budget bill um, and uh, asked, or I guess directed the Infrastructure Authority to contract with a firm to conduct a study comparing Wyoming's oil and gas tax rates with uh, a set of pure states. Um, the language itself was fairly broad, but I think uh, it allowed us the latitude to explore a lot of different options. Um, one thing that I think is important to point out, uh, within the RFP, you know, we were really looking at a average price per barrel, average price per MCF calculation. Um, one of the things that we discovered really digging into those pure states, and, and we did discuss this with Chairman Madden, um, Chairman Von Flater, and with the Minerals Committee, as well as, um, uh, I guess, Majority Floor Leader Perkins, was that <clears throat> Wyoming is unique in a lot of ways because we really don't have different tax treatments for oil or gas depending on the way that it's produced. And that's very unusual. For example, Oklahoma uh, could tax a barrel of oil four different ways depending on when and how it was treated. And so doing that per barrel or per MCF calculation would have provided, I think, over 30 data points. In wouldn't have provided really the clarity that I think uh, that the, uh, the legislature is looking for. So in consultation with uh, the, the chairman, um, we, we decided that the uh, effective tax rate calculation in that methodology was a better sort of apples to apples comparison. And, and I think the lesson learned here is that it is extremely difficult to do an apples to apples comparison when you're looking across different states with different tax jurisdictions, um, different ways of, or, or I guess different points of valuation, um, you know, different exemptions. 
So, uh, you know, I think what we ended up here was is a good and very thorough understanding of the overall industry and how it's taxed. Um, and within the report itself, it's, you know, it, it, there's a lot of information in there, but kind of those key summary and conclusions are on page nine. And um, I guess I will have uh, uh, Daniel here go through the specifics of the, uh, of the tax study itself. Yeah. But um, I will be happy to answer any questions <laughs> that I can regarding process or, or why we did the things that we did. But um, okay, Mr. Chairman, that sounds good. You're Daniel Johnson, is that? Well, oh, actually, I'm David Sorry, Johnston. David. <laughs> David, okay. And uh, oh, he Daniel, got me confused. See? <laughs> <laughs> Daniel's my twin brother. Oh. We're from Ranchester and uh, Sheridan right now. I live in Parkland, Wyoming. Okay. And to give you a little background, Daniel Johnston and company has probably worked in more than 100 countries or for 100 countries in the oil and gas industry, even though there's only about 50 countries that actually have um, a significant amount of oil and gas. It depends on the oil price, of course. We work for most of the major oil companies around the planet. We've got one of the largest databases of uh, contracts around the planet. And uh, there are very few people in the planet on the planet that spend as much time on this particular subject, which is the division of profits or the take for um, oil and gas. And we know all of the experts on the planet and many times we work with them. Uh, we've been involved in a number of disputes, about 66 of them. And uh, we learn a lot from those disputes as to what can go wrong with these contracts. So I think I'm bringing to the table some experience that should help the committee understand what's going on. So I'll get started and what I've prepared, and I don't know how this works, I should be on the screen. And if not, <clears throat> I can just go through and I plan to go through just our conclusions <coughs> and then be available for cool. questions. There we go. So there were eight states with Wyoming. Uh, we included two states that are kind of outliers and that's Oklahoma and Texas and uh, their productivity and geology kind of dwarfs Wyoming's. So if we look at just the other states the, and North Dakota also, um, the states other than North Dakota, Oklahoma and Texas are probably more like Wyoming. But we did the study and one of our first conclusions was Wyoming's effective tax rate, and that's a term that most of the other states have used in their studies, this effective tax rate. We have a little bit of a problem with that term effective tax rate because severance taxes and the uh, ad valorem tax or county tax or gross production taxes that we talk about aren't truly taxes. They behave more like royalties. They come off the top for the most part. So we talk about an effective royalty rate from the oil company's perspective, <clears throat> they look at the effective royalty rate and that has a big impact or can have a big impact on how quickly they recover their costs. It's going to impact their payout, how long it takes them to get their money back. Now the fiscal terms in these states are not that tough by world standards, but Wyoming's um, effective tax rate and effective royalty rate are slightly higher than the other states. Um, so I guess I am, I am on the screen. There's how many of you did not get a copy of the report? I, I planned on referring to the report, so many of you may be disadvantaged. Mr. But, Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Sackett sent it out to the entire committee. I'm, I'm not sure, but it was just before the meeting. Oh, okay. So it, it is in your email inbox. Okay. Okay, you've got about 150 pages to read very quickly. <laughs> Do I have to take a recess? <laughs> <laughs> so <clears throat> I don't think it's any surprise that the effective tax rate or the effective royalty rate is higher in Wyoming, typically, because that has showed up in uh, reports in 2016 and 2017 in Colorado, Idaho, North Dakota, a number of reports. Um, our second um, Conclusion, 
Wyoming takes a larger share of profits on state lands than its peers, roughly 2% more according to calculations, maybe 4% based on um, actual numbers. Now there's a number of different ways to uh, calculate this division of profits or what we call as take, but uh, I would say 2% is slightly higher. It's not a big difference. If we talk about the take world average, the world average take, and that's what the government gets profits. It's more like Wyoming is more like 45% number of things. So there's a big difference between world average, a very small difference between the various states. Some backup material. Here's our third uh, um, assumption, not assumption, conclusion. Not only do we have, we being Wyoming, a slightly higher effective royalty rate, which makes it a little tougher for the oil companies, we also have in Wyoming what we call the marketable product approach to allowing deductions for the uh, determination of the royalty. That's more difficult for the oil companies than the at the wellhead terminology. If you're an at the wellhead state like Texas, Montana, North Dakota, um, the oil companies are allowed more deductions than would be allowed in Wyoming. So it makes it a little bit tougher. Um, I'm going to look at Wyoming's um, <clears throat> taxes and royalties. It looks like it's fairly of um, risk. Wyoming takes pretty much everything that they get off the top. The royalties come off the top. That's language that's typically used with royalties. And the uh, severance tax is determined as gross revenue less the royalty. And so is the ad valorem tax or the county tax. So they all behave like royalties. One of the um, adverse effects of having these high effective royalty rates is um, early termination of these projects. Uh, we don't have any incentives to speak of. We have uh, lower severance taxes on stripper wells, but that's not necessarily an incentive for the oil companies to come in and drill. It's an incentive to keep the oil pumping, and uh, most of the states have a stripper well or um, lower severance taxes on those types of projects. So it's not a big deal. But... Uh, <clears throat> I would say um, this should be actually conclusion number five. We got a little mixed up on the numbering. Higher tax rates do not discourage exploration and production. Yeah. It depends on geology. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, royalty rate in Texas lands 25%, uh, quite a bit higher than Wyoming's state um, royalties. And since Texas doesn't have much federal land, if you compare the exploration and production that's going on in the Permian Basin, the taxes in the Permian Basin and all over Texas for the most part are sig significantly higher than Wyoming's. They're going to the Permian Basin because that is one fabulous piece of geology, plain and simple. The last... Uh, um, Conclusion we had, production on federal land adds delays. This red tape just about drives us to distraction. If Wyoming wants um, exploration activity, and they certainly do, we've got to start um, cutting through the red tape and getting these projects approved. We've got the Sublet County project, the Converse County projects that are online, which would add, what is it, um, 8,500 wells. We've been years waiting to get those projects approved. That's not necessarily Wyoming's fault because most of that or a lot of that is on federal land. So we, <clears throat> worldwide, we look at India when it takes them two years to approve a project and then they still have to go through the Defense Department in India as one of the worst on the planet. We're way beyond that in getting these projects. It's almost criminal. So those are, the some, those are some of the things that we looked at and thought were key to um, this comparison of the other states.
I've got a couple of other slides if we do need them, but that's, that's my summary and uh, I'm open to questions. So you want to take questions now? I don't want to. Oh. No. <laughs> I thought I no, heard I'm you say that. For questions. Yes. He's open for questions. He doesn't want anybody. He's open for them. Who, anybody who wants to start, go ahead, Senator Case. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you very much for your work on the report. I'm, I do appreciate it. I'm not completely understanding how other corporate taxes are modeled into the effective tax rate or if, if they are. For um, like an income tax or uh, ad valor or value added tax or is that included in housing included in the, the comparison? And I didn't understand that when I, and I've only seen it really briefly, but I appreciate thoughts about that. Um, most of the reports only focus on the severance taxes and the county or gross products tax or ad valorem tax. Mm -hmm. There was one report and the guy complained that we're not taking into consideration all of the means by which the government, the state governments get their share of the profits. So <clears throat> that particular report included sales and use tax and corporate income taxes. Corporate uh, sales and use tax is almost insignificant. Mm. Um, typically when we're calculating the take, the division of profits, and that's just economic profits, not taking a look at the discounted cash flow. Gotcha. We ignore bonuses. We ignore the insignificant taxes like the conservation tax, the environmental tax, um, and we go after the bigger pieces of pie. Um, for Wyoming, we don't have a corporate income tax. And so if we're doing the quote unquote effective tax rate here, we look at the severance tax and the county tax. But what about the other states? Yeah, well, I'm trying to well, get in it. the other states, there's a couple of different so they can take the uh, I'll do the approach two ways for Wyoming. One would be you, <clears throat> you take gross revenue and you assume it's 100 percent. If it's federal land, you take a 12 and a half percent royalty off the top. Gotcha. Uh, the severance tax comes net 6 percent of gross revenue less the 12 and a half percent royalty. The county tax is the same thing. <laughs> right. So <clears throat> you come up with about a 23% effective tax rate. As if you had collapsed all of those three fiscal elements into one single royalty, because they, for, more, for the most part, like come companies. off the top. So that's one approach, and you'd come up with an effective royalty rate or effective tax rate in Wyoming of 23%. Um, in the other states, or, or what you could do with Wyoming is say, well, <clears throat> we had $100 million in gross revenue from all of our production from oil and gas. And then our receipts from the severance tax were... A gross amount. Yeah. Gross amount, $400, $4 million. Gotcha. And the county tax is $3.7 million or something like that. And then you do an imputed... Um, effective tax rate based on the actual receipts. One would be based on oil and gas at 6% for the severance tax. Mm -hmm. The other one where you're taking the actual revenues has to include or is going to include the stripper wells, which has a lower severance tax. I see your point so there. You're, you're mixing numbers and you're not making an apples to apples comparison. But in these studies, we see those calculations made both ways. I see. So, um, Mr. Chairman, can I talk, think out loud for a second? Go, ahead, um, go back and forth. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, so if you did, it, I see your point exactly about the stripper wells mm -hmm. and uh, because they have um, a lower rate and they're, they're mixing up the effective tax rate for the, basically the new production or how we'd look at an incentive structure. So I'm trying to think how you'd do that, but it seems to me that if you could get rid of the stripper well factors um, and the differentials in those rates between strippers and other wells, and it must be more complicated even in other states than in Wyoming, which would be even harder to do. But this fact that we don't have a corporate tax would be significant. And if, if I learned anything from your, I've only briefly looked at it, we, we are slightly higher on the effective tax rate is kind of what I, I saw, yes. but, but not a lot, only slightly. And if you think there's any effect from 
taxing profits in the other states and you could really figure out how to get to that, we're probably not any higher. We may not be if you could really model that incorrectly. I'll throw that out and I'll look for a reaction. Yeah. That could be true. Um, oh, yeah. Because Wyoming doesn't have an effective, or excuse me, a corporate income tax, <laughs> you're taking on almost no risk. Right. If an oil company goes into production, you're going to get your share. Absolutely. Three big parts, the royalty, the severance tax, and that county tax. You don't have to worry about the, the tax. So well, that's yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Thank you. You're the first <laughs> person ever, actually. <laughs> ever agreed with you. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, Representative Obermuller. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have a uh, follow-up on the income tax aspect of it. Uh, how do the how, how does it interface in other states in terms of how they treat the two in combination income tax and severance tax? Are severance taxes credits against the income tax? Are they deductions for the income tax? Deductions. They're deductions and not credits. So they end up paying, in a sense, both layers. Uh, yes, but because it's a, uh, the deductions around the world are fairly common, credits are not. Yeah. A credit would be a, a, a lot better for the oil companies than a deduction. Yeah, correct. <laughs> right, dollar for dollar. Yeah, correct. Yeah. <laughs> um, you get your question answered? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, I, I got. I have one, uh, uh, just a spinoff from Senator Case. He came up with an interesting thing here. You know, we got, you have uh, your conclusions, uh, given the, the subset of taxes that you studied, well, uh, the, the major set of taxes that were a little bit higher. So my question is, is if you consider some of these other taxes that are of second order in magnitude, you know, like a employment taxes, workers comp and, and these kind of things. And if you take uh, the income tax that we already talked about, uh, what about industrial property, not including minerals, but you know, on, the, on, the, on the plant and equipment itself is, I assume that would be a, of second order magnitude also, but would you agree that our industrial uh, property tax is considerably lower than these neighboring states? I'm not familiar with the industrial property taxes. Okay. Well, it'd be or things like uh, compressor stations and, and for, um, you know, uh, load, loading facilities, you know, just kind of, uh, industrial property that is is not the mineral itself, I guess, and you know we talked about that last year and another. I think pipelines fall under that. Yeah, pipelines is part of it. Yeah, it, it, that's an important part of it. Thank you. But uh, I know those taxes are lower, and I'm just wondering if it's all that little bit that we're higher would be offset by a combination of these taxes that we, you know, that I mentioned there. Could be. I don't know. We did not look at yeah, the industrial taxes. Anyone else? Mm -hmm. Can't wait to read the whole thing. Ms. Yeah. Can't wait to read the whole thing. Sorry, I didn't have my mic on. I think uh, Ms. Representative Ms. Sweeney's got his hand up. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Um, was I think this is the answer is going to be no, but um, was depreciation any part of the modeling um, or matrix in um, as far as looking at all of this um, is depreciation in as part of the calculation there are uh, two major two major steps when we do an analysis of the division of profits or the tax burden on an oil company one is the undiscounted, and that's the government take undiscounted, and that's based on economic profits, which ignores depreciation. You go a step further and you get into accounting profits or financial profits, which takes not only depreciation, but timing it into consideration. 
if you look at Wyoming's undiscounted share of profits versus their discounted, the discounted, and this is the same with almost every country and every state, the state's share discounted is much higher than the undiscounted because the oil companies are coming up with the costs and it takes them a while to get their costs back. So the discounting reduces the contractor's um, share of profits. <coughs> you have your mic on? If you could just run that one more time as far as the, the discounted versus the undiscounted right at the end. Um, hmm. Let's see, let's say Wyoming's share of profits is 45% undiscounted. Undiscounted at costs of say 40% of gross revenue. At costs at 40% of gross revenue, if the undiscounted share of profits to Wyoming is 45%, the discounted share of profits to Wyoming could be easily 55%. And that takes depreciation and timing into consideration because it's a full discounted cash flow, which is much more complex than the undiscounted because you take the discount rate and the depreciation and the timing and the production profile and the cost profile and the oil price profile. And that's why we start with the undiscounted, it's much easier. But we almost always do the discounted cash flow calculations too. It's one of the hallmarks of the industry. Representative Connolly had her hand up. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Johnson, I didn't, I didn't get a chance to read all the 138 pages, and I look forward to that. But I'm looking at one of your charts, the table four on page 25, and it's using fiscal year 2016-17. That was a pretty volatile year for minerals in, in Wyoming. And I'm curious if that kind of one-year comparison is a good enough snapshot for us to extrapolate. Um, probably that? not. You know, Wyoming has another problem, <laughs> and it's not at the state level so much. And I think it would show up here when we talk about property taxes. 2016 to 2017, <clears throat> I think those were the two years where about 330 oil companies went bankrupt. You've got a, is it a one year or 16 month delay between collecting county taxes? Yep. <laughs> you ought to. And so some of those taxes are probably not paid. You've got companies declaring bankruptcy. And so you're going to have a distortion, a number of distortions because we were falling off that cliff. That was just a terrible time for the oil companies. I mean, it just was bad. And unfortunately, I don't think this last upturn in the oil prices was enough to offset that, uh, that crash. Okay, anyone else? <clears throat> one thing, that I have a question. Does anybody else have their hand up? Um, one, one thing I had, a, and I don't expect you to have actual hard data on this, but it, it seems like the, with the structure of our tax system, um, it, it's more stable through time than other states. So maybe I'm wrong on that because not taxing profits, we're just taxing off the top, as you say. So the only thing is that can mess with this is is prices and and output. But compared to other states, um, do they have more volatility just in the mineral sector or less than we do, based on the tax system itself? I mean, it's hard to make a comparison, but just. And I know you, it won't be in your paper, but because of your vast knowledge, I just wondered how, <laughs> how that. Well, as far as Wyoming taxes are concerned, the, the, the overall taxes for the oil and gas industry rock solid. We haven't changed much for right. a long time. Of course, the ad valorem fluctuates from year to year based on the mill levy. Right. Yeah, wow. it's rock solid. On production, actually. Um, yeah. It, yeah. Uh, I just wondered if... And, uh, but the other states haven't changed much for, for some time. We look at the four or five incentives that 
uh, Montana introduced in 2000. They haven't changed them for eight years. And Utah, I think it's similar to that, if not a longer. Mm -hmm. So they, the, the states haven't changed much. No, I know that part. But what I was referring to is through a, a, a cycle, a production cycle, a, like a business cycle in the sec in the industry, is our over an entire cycle. Do we have more stability in revenue as as uh, minerals go up and down in production and value and stuff compared to other states, or or do we have less or more? I should say. Maybe the I'm only not. thing where that might have an impact that I can think of off the top of my head is you, end, you approach the end of the life of the field and you start to approach this economic limit when the oil companies just aren't making enough money to continue. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> what we're seeing worldwide is big problems at the end of the life because we've got some of these legacy fields approaching the end of the life. Not only are they hoping to shut these things in earlier, they don't want to maintain or pay for the maintenance that they have been for 30 or 40 years. And so the, the governments are rebelling. They don't have the language in the contracts to protect themselves against the uh, oil companies backing off on maintenance and, and shutting these fields in earlier. Our fiscal terms in Wyoming are not very forgiving when it comes to the end of the life of the field because our effective royalty rate does not move. So that's another a bit of a hardship on our partners, the oil companies. And if we think of them as partners. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else? Uh, Representative Sweeney. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You mentioned the word incentive. Um, uh, and I, I think it was in reference to Montana. Um, and this past session in 18, um, uh, the president of the Senate uh, ran a incentive bill um, trying to reduce, I think it was the, the severance tax year three. Um, year three, uh, year three of production. Correct. Two or three. It was, <laughs> was it two or three? Mr. Chairman. I think it was yeah, it's, it was it was amended, but I don't remember exactly. And it it didn't. Uh, unfortunately, in the house, it didn't go any place. Um, but is that the type of thing that um, uh, that Montana has done when you when you mention incentive? Here's Montana. It's happened to have it. Utah. Montana has what we call tax holidays, and they're used all over the world, or royalty holidays. Um, and they do it for incremental production, horizontal recompleted, horizontal drilled wells. So a number of different scenarios. They initiate it in 2000, and this is not definitive, but it's a quick look at whether or not those incentives introduced in 2000 had any real impact on drilling activity and we take a look at the rig count, which is one of the first places we go to see if an incentive has had any impact. And we compare the rig count in Wyoming to the rig count in Montana. And as far as I can tell from that, <laughs> there wasn't an improvement based on that incentive. There's, there's other ways to help the oil companies. And at $50 a barrel with West Texas Intermediate, it was 51 this morning. That's what, 45 for Wyoming oil? The oil companies could probably use some help, but you're taking on a lot of risk, I think, by just lowering the sevens tax for a 12 month holiday or 18 month holiday like Montana did, and then not see um, a significant increase in drilling. There's lots of different ways to do it, all of which would probably require Wyoming to take on some additional risk. Mr. Chairman. Who, who's that? Uh, it's oh, go ahead, Senator Case. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so we looked at this uh, in a different study quite a few years ago. It was on mineral tax incentives, and we hired folks from the University of Wyoming to do a study, which was 
Um, and it was actually published in the American Economic Review. And it basically said that, that marginal changes in the uh, level of the production taxes, meaning basically severance, didn't have a lot of impact on a company's uh, decision to drill or not drill. I mean, very substantial changes possibly, but, you know, smaller changes did not. And, and I think what we heard in testimony uh, supporting the bill that Representative Sweeney was talking about was that that was true then for vertical wells and um, they had more of an unknown production life. But but the geology is getting so well known that now that when you have horizontal wheel, wells drilled in the proven pay zones, that you can model that very, very specifically. And indeed, the times have changed so that they are very sensitive to incentives. I think that was the testimony offered in the Senate. It never made any sense to me whatsoever. And I think this study, I mean, you even said that it's the geology, that um, that these little changes in the incentive taking us down a couple of points, up a couple of points, would probably not have not have much effect on production decisions. But, and I did get your point, we could do a better job in end of life fields because where their costs go up and everybody understands why their costs go up. If it's a, if they're pumping a lot more water, tons and tons of water, and that's a cost to them. And we, we just are sharing, we don't think about that. So there's a possibility there. But um, I, I think this study reinforces the earlier study very clearly. Um, and uh, I appreciate the good work. Well, thank, thank you very much. Yes. Yeah. Um, Do you have something else? Uh, uh, follow up to that, Mr. Chairman. When, when you say end of life, is that year 40 um, in, the, in that instance, or would that be possibly an incentive at year three when production has has the peak production year one two um would we consider year three mr chairman i, I think i'm thinking of and i'm not an oil and gas guy very much but i know that the cost of producing um uh, oil go up for a field and it's largely driven by pumping and electricity costs and having to separate a lot of water and when those fields start to not play out but that's long term yeah. i mean there are there's fields in fremont county the oldest fields in wyoming um, they've been in production for a hundred years and they still they still make oil but it, it, they have to pump an enormous amount of water and separate it out, and it's very sensitive to electricity prices. At the same time, Wyoming gets paid off the top because it's the value of the oil that's sold that doesn't consider the fact that they had to enormously pump and pump and pump and pump to get that little bit of oil. And there's probably not a very good connection, but that is what a stripper is, and I don't completely understand uh, how it works. But that's what, and we do have a reduced rate for strippers. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's not the right rate, but we do have that. And I, I'll we'll try to learn more about that too. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, you're welcome. Anyone else? Well, I want to get some time here if everybody's kind of happy with where they're at now. Audience uh, that has a question after listening to this that you'd like to ask. I mean, we've got. We got time and everything, so if you if you have anything you'd like to ask, I just ask if you want to approach the microphone. We can have Mr. Beggar go find someplace else to sit. And <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there's no one that has a question. If there isn't, any, was there any other matters we want to take on this? I guess. Uh, um, do you have an executive summary? I see. I'm I'm running the meeting, so I haven't looked at what we have here. But is there an executive summary that uh, we can kind of bring it to the rest of the uh, members of the legislature during the session? Or Mr. Chairman, on page nine is the okay. summary and conclusions. There's six bullet points that okay. summarize the major findings. Okay, that 
And it references mm -hmm. appropriate sections within the yeah. entire 138 pages. All right. Well, some vehicle ought to be thought about, I guess, by the, by the legislature. I, I don't expect, well, you, I guess if electronic copies, you could send the whole thing to the legislature also. But uh, what's, what, do you, what, what do you think the disposition of this should be? Anybody else have any ideas? It'd be a shame just to have it go on the shelf like so many of our other studies do. Yeah, it would be better to have it out there where people can roll around with it. And, and Mr. Chairman, um, we just saw it for the first time today. Yeah. Um, our colleagues would probably also welcome having access to the report. It's possible that some folks would like another presentation on it during the session when we're all here. It's of great significance. Yeah. I you know, because they, you're right. People give you this, uh, these kind of questions. You know, in restaurants and uh, other social places you go, they say, "Is our taxes too high or too low?" Or <coughs> this is uh, good stuff for all ninety of them to look at. Mr. Chairman, before um, before ahead. we leave this subject. Um, um, I'm I'm just curious, and I really appreciate you you putting out the slide. I think that's great stuff. Um, and I know I, I'm pretty confident that there it's going to come forward on an incentive. And I just wondered, Mr. Chairman, um, if if in your line of thought. Is there something out there that you feel might be appropriate to look at for Wyoming um, when we're going through this process um, for the for the industry that might spur production? I mean, we that's pretty. Pretty good evidence that won't. Um, after three years or after five years or um, at, at the Petroleum Association's um, annual annual meeting this summer, um, I mean, they did something here, one. Um, I, I don't know if that, that will carry much water, but I ju just wondered if you had an opinion or a thought. I do. You have a response? I, thank you for asking that question. I think it's an important one. And in the United States, are sliding scales. There are some, but they're ineffective. Full stop. But if, if you asked me if our partners, the oil companies, needed some help when oil prices are at $50 a barrel, I'd say, yeah, they probably do. So how could we help them as in taking on too much risk? So let's say we lower to the severance taxes to three and oil prices are $50 a barrel or less. <clears throat> Above $50 a barrel, it goes back to a 5% severance tax. This is the sliding scale. And <clears throat> the federal government used to have one similar to this. Uh, when the oil prices are above $70 a barrel, maybe the severance tax goes to 8%. So it would even out depending upon how the oil prices flow, but that requires the state to take on some risk. I don't think that would be near the risk of a tax holiday where you drop the severance tax from 6 to 4% and hope that um, exploration activity picks up. Mr. Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Mr. Representative. Or Senator Case. I'll answer anything. <laughs> so, Mr. Chairman, I, um, I don't really disagree with you, but that's sort of a fairness and equity argument. And it's saying our partners, let's have a better bottom line. Um, okay, that's, but how the, the, this, as an opportunity for us to lower rates to increase exploration and give us a bigger curve in the future by bringing more wells online. I think what we've learned today is that there's a 
This is not connected to exploration. Yes, it might be connected to profitability. I'm going to make the opposite arguments a little bit here. It is true, it's a tough business. People go out of business. In the 2015, it was really rough. But the wells keep producing. They might go to someone else. As long as they're economically better to produce them than not, somebody's going to own those wells eventually, and we'll be getting our take. So if we, if we forego taxes that we would have got anyway, because it doesn't change the production decision for most wells, then all we've really done is given up money in the, for the state of Wyoming, which in my opinion belongs to the people of Wyoming. I don't think you have the right to do that. So it's a sort of different take on that. Changing our level of severance and or of our level of production taxes doesn't seem to be very directly linked to changes in exploration behavior. And, and that's clear from the previous study, seems to be pretty clear from this study, and, and it really ought to begin to put to bed that argument that we keep hearing here. Okay, thank you very much. Anyone else? All right, is it? Yes. Representative Conway. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Would it be fair to say that what's going on is geology and the market? Those are the two that are the most important and relevant when it comes to thinking about kind of the, the bottom line with kind of state revenues that we get. And that other than those two, we're just mucking, we're moving around with it for pennies, it seems like. Um, just thinking about the notion of an incentive in the third year, that just doesn't seem to make sense at all to me if we're talking really about just geology in the market. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, can I word it slightly different, but I agree with you 100%. Oil prices determine how much people are going to explore or invest in exploration. Geology tells them where they're going to spend it. Well, I don't know if it's better. but <laughs> <laughs> You're almost an expert now. <laughs> Anyone else? I think we deserve a break. Well, we're, we're this is it for today. Our agenda is exhausted. Huh? This, this has uh, been a fabulous afternoon. <laughs> I thought maybe this would take longer, but you know, it took less time than I thought. Thank you so much. Yeah, thanks a lot. We might for bring coming you back down. to talk. Thank, thank all of you. It, thank you very much. And Mr. Johnson is going to go up and and talk to the 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 other committee, the Minerals Committee. Well, tomorrow morning. Well, you, you need to get on that windy road then. And yeah. <laughs> okay. They might be a little bit more unhappy than the uh, Revenue Committee. Okay, well. Really? <laughs> the next. I'm afraid so. <laughs> we, have, we come back here again next tomorrow. Um, it, well, a lot of times the uh, co-chair and I will have the meeting start at 8 o'clock, but this one starts at 8.30. So. Uh, you get a little extra sleep to tomorrow morning. Is there anything else that we need to mention? Do you think 8.30 of? start time tomorrow. 8.30 start time. Read your bills over and be ready with amendments. We've got a busy agenda, as you can see. So did we approve any minutes, or do we have some minutes to approve? We don't approve minutes, do we? I don't know. Uh, we don't. I don't think we, we approve minutes at committees because they're not official anyway. <laughs> All right. Thanks, folks, for coming. We'll see you tomorrow. Mr. Chairman, was was there a reception? Not for everybody. Six. Okay. Oh, uh, it's six o'clock at Taco John's. Representative Sweeney. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. <laughs>